open session to order we have nothing to report from closed session we have a change to the agenda yeah please sorry thank you Aaron Present. Here. 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 Yeah, we need to make a couple changes on the agenda. So we need to pull item 5.8 from the consent agenda, and we need on item 5. 9.5 eliminate the uh, reference to the MTA because of the fact that we didn't agree to the same language on the TA. So, okay. so with those changes, do I have a motion to approve? I'll move to approve as changed. Second. Thank you. Uh, please call. She waved. <laughs> So I'm getting some feedback from some people that's very hard for them to hear us. So maybe we need to make sure we're in the microphones. Jessica said something. Present. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Excellent. So, item five. Consent agenda. Do we have a motion? I muted it. Yeah. Turn your sound off on your computer. Okay. So, uh, consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on that? No. Okay. Please call vote, Aaron. Aye. Aye. 
Aye. Mr. Yes. Mr. Aye. Aye. Okay. And six, recycled and potable water system update. Jason, do we have Matt joining us? Yeah, so Matt Kennedy from GHD is here online to present to us for the uh, potable and recycled water projects. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, what I'm gonna do to start out is um, share my screen. I'm gonna, I have just a few uh, documents up uh, that I can use uh, to illustrate some of the uh, progress that's being made on the water and the recycled water. Um, and let's see, I think Jason or whoever is hosting the meeting um, will need to enable my participant screen sharing capability. Okay, looks like it happened. Bear with me just one moment. Aaron, can you put the his, uh, oh, he just did, or there's his screen. Okay, so I have, I have the screen share up. Can everyone see it? Yes. Great, okay, so what I'm sharing with you are the 60% level design drawings that were prepared and submitted to the school district and to the state last month. Um, that, where we are with that project is in the midst of design. Um, we have to date, uh, since getting started with design, met with the Division of the State Architect, DSA, uh, and had a pre-application meeting with them to discuss the project, go over the details, and make sure we were aware and they were aware of any uh, key issues or potential um, challenges that we may need to overcome uh, with the design. One issue did come up during that meeting, which was the size of the tanks. Um, currently, the Minimum uh, fire code requires about 180,000 gallons of storage, which is equivalent to about two hours at 1,500 gallons per minute flow. And the school district's two existing tanks are about 115,000 gallons. Um, that is also, that volume is also the limit that the State Division of Finance, uh, who is funding the design and who we will be applying to to fund construction, that's the limit that they place on uh, replacement tank volume. Um, so this was raised by DSA and we did get over that issue. They did follow up with set us and said that it would be acceptable for us to replace the tanks with equivalent volume. And um, in, the, in the, uh, the process of design, what we are uh, building in is the ability to increase the volume of the tanks uh, to about 100,000 gallons each, which would in the future at some point um, bring them to a total volume of 200,000 gallons. Uh, but within this project, the, between the two tanks, there is about 200, or excuse me, 115,000 gallons. And I'm gonna flip ahead a few sheets here in our set and share with you. Uh, uh, you know, did you also go over the recycled water proposal yes, with sir. them? Because I there, will, yes. There's, I'm gonna an, go additional, over that in there's an additional tank involved in that. That's the, the, yes. The, we have a. We're proposing a 250,000 gallon tank in that project, and I believe, although I'm not certain, but I believe the fact that that volume is proposed at the tank site, the well and tank site that may have uh, led DSA to allow for the smaller water tanks. Um, so that was the, the outcome of the, the pre-application meeting with DSA and we're now in the midst of design. And um, this is the uh, school district's tank and well site, which is located uh, just a little bit north and east of the K through eight campus. Um, Excuse me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on that site and I'm gonna share with you kind of what it looks like um, today and what the improvements look like. So currently there's a 500,000 gallon redwood tank. There's a 65,000 gallon 
bolted steel tank. And there's a water treatment building in a wood frame water treatment building, which is where the pH of the water is adjusted and chlorine is added for disinfection. What we're proposing in this project, as a reminder, just a refresher on what I presented last time, is to demolish those two tanks and to construct two new tanks of equivalent volume. We're sizing them for, if memory serves, 57,500 gallons approximately each. They would be on reinforced concrete foundations and they will replace the two existing tanks. Those two new tanks will be constructed of type 316 bolted stainless steel. We're also proposing to demolish and replace the existing water treatment building and put in a new concrete masonry unit or CMU building, a block building for the chlorination system, the water pH adjustment system, and the water quality monitoring equipment. So these are the equipment that's used to monitor pH, turbidity, and chlorine residual. I'm going to just flip ahead through a couple of the plans to illustrate the project components. This shows the contractor's access and staging zoomed in on the tank site and the well site itself. And one other feature I'll point out here is right down here off the page is the school district's well number one. And this is well number two. And we constructed in December what's called the test well, which is this symbol here, or excuse me, it's this symbol here, test well. So this is a new well that will have equivalent capacity to well number one, capable of producing somewhere on the order of 10 to 15 gallons per minute of water. And then let me just also point out property boundaries. So this is the school district's property boundary here. This parcel over here is also school district property. So everything is built on school district property. This plan shows the demolition of the tank site. So indicating the tanks being demolished, the water lines that supply the tank also being demolished, the treatment building being demolished. There are a total of 18 trees that need to be removed in order to facilitate the construction of the new tanks to grade the site. And also for the new treatment and water treatment building and control building and to provide a little bit of parking and better access up into the tank site. All of the trees that are removed in the project will be replanted somewhere on the school district's property up here at the tank site. No, if if one of those trees is is the tree that has the antenna for our radio station. I know which one you're referring to. That one is it's a little off the page. It's kind of up here where my hand is. So, yeah, we're not going to take that tree down. That one will remain. Can you clarify? You don't mean those same trees are going to be dug up and replanted. You mean replaced. I'm sorry, I had a hard time understanding. You said those trees were going to be replanted. You don't mean those individual trees are going to be replanted. You mean they're going to be replaced with the same number of trees? Correct. Yes, they'll be replaced with the same number of trees and the type to be determined. And I have a plan to show you a tentative plan on where those trees could be located and replanted. This is a erosion control plan. I'm going to skip that. It's not very interesting. That's just to keep sediment and erosion from running off of the site if there was a storm during construction. This is the grading plan. So we are proposing to bring in a little bit of fill in here on the order of about 300 cubic yards to level the site off and for the two new tanks. And also what we're doing here, you'll notice this area here is being set aside for the future recycled water tank. The tanks will have overflows on them. So if water for if for some reason the wells kept pumping water into the tanks, 
and didn't shut off, there was a failure of a control system or something like that, the water would overflow out into this swale and drain down into an existing swale that traverses across the school district's property. This would also be the path that water would flow if the tanks were ever drained or emptied for inspection purposes or repair purposes in the future. This is the site improvement plan. So this shows the location of the new chlorination and control building and the two tanks. And then also the DSA requires a fire access road that is an improved fire access road that's at least 20 feet wide up to the tank site. So we're improving the access road up there. And we may need to extend it down all the way to the maintenance building. And I think that's one change that we're going to make in the next design submittal. And the next design submittal is what goes into DSA for review and approval. And then I'm going to just hold it here for a moment and point out the new trees that we're proposing. These are shown at approximately what the full canopy would look like once the tree is fully grown. And we've just scattered them along the access road here adjacent to Little Lake Road. And then also here along the back with the intent of providing some visual screening of the new tanks from the adjacent property owner neighbor and also screening from the road. This is a, sorry, was there a question? Okay, I'll continue. This is, this plan shows the piping plan showing where water would be piped from the new test well, which will be converted to a production well. The existing well number two, which needs to be rehabilitated to restore its capacity. And then existing well number one, which will remain in place and just be cleaned. All three wells will pump into the building. And as the water goes through the building, it'll be treated, measured, and discharged. And then it'll flow up to each of the tanks. The piping for the tanks is being designed so that the tanks could be operated in parallel. So that is that the water would enter this distribution system from both tanks at the same time. The water could be, the tanks could be isolated. So water could enter the distribution system from one tank only. And that would maybe be a case when a tank needed to be taken out of service for cleaning or maintenance or repairs. Or the tanks could be operated in series where water would flow, for example, from tank one to tank two and then into the system. So the design intent is to provide operational flexibility. This drawing also shows where the overflows are located. Those are those, these square symbols on the plan. Those are inlets where overflow and drain would enter and then drain out and discharge to the swale. And the tanks would be interconnected with the district's existing distribution system. We would also put a flow meter on the distribution main as the water is exiting the site to measure the amount of water that is entering the distribution system. So being used to meet potable water demands or if a fire hydrant was opened or if the water was used for irrigation purposes in an interim period when recycled water was not being used. We're also providing a water service to the building so that we have a couple of hose bibs outside. So if water was needed at the building, it's available. And this is a detailed view of the tanks and the piping interconnected. And what you see out here are seismic joints with isolation valves. And these are to seismically isolate the piping in the site from the tanks themselves. Matt, what's the height of the new tanks compared to the current height? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What is the height of the new tanks compared to the current height? The height of the new tanks compared to the current height 
these tanks will be slightly lower in height compared to the current tanks i want to i don't have the exact measurement on the the tank heights but i think they're on the order of about 20 to 25 feet and these tanks will be just a moment here oh i don't have the file up i think these tanks here are going to be on the order of about 17 feet in height but with the ability to expand them i think it's up to about 25 to 30 feet which would bring that additional volume up to about 100 000 gallons so the foundation is going to be based on an assumption of the the higher height with the 100 000 gallons in each tank correct yes the both the foundation and the tank walls the tank shell the panels that are bolted together to make up the tank walls at the base is always thicker and then the walls get thinner as you go up so the tanks will essentially be designed for that future volume but only constructed for the volume that's funded by the division of financial assistance okay the next handful of sheets just reflect some of the details of the the site the piping the inlets pipe supports um flow meter fire hydrant we do need to add a fire hydrant to the site plan and um, i failed to point that out i'll do that very quickly but we've tentatively located a fire hydrant down here close to the kind of mid midway or so between the maintenance yard and the tanks it needs to be uh, um, a minimum of or uh, excuse me uh, no more than 400 feet from the building the new building and i think we're a couple of hundred feet away i'm going to share with you some of the details of the building next so this is the floor plan of the building on the left and the building is, uh, as I noted, it's a CMU building. We're proposing a split face on the exterior and a smooth face on the interior. The area on the left is the chemical room. This is where the sodium hypochlorite uh, solution is stored for disinfection. And the um, sodium hydroxide or the caustic solution that's used to adjust the pH uh, there is also metering pumps located in this room for metering the solution into the piping, and I'll show you that on um, a, a future plan. And then the control room here is where the pump controls will be located. The instrumentation for monitoring pH, turbidity, and chlorine will be located. Um, lighting controls uh, and the telemetry system, so how the data that's collected on the flow rate and the water quality is um, stored and um, documented for, for uh, reporting purposes. There will also be a, a little porch out front. Um, I think I've got it at four feet wide, a couple of windows for lighting, uh, double door access to the chemical room to make it easy to bring uh, the drums in or out and store other materials and a single door access to the control room. And we'll, we're also gonna be putting a small desk in here and a chair you could put a computer in there to um, to keep track of the data um, these are views of the tank plans so these show generally what each of the tanks would look like if you were to slice through the walls of the tank um, showing where the inlet water comes in where the outlet is and what we're attempting to do is put the water in kind of generally opposite of where the water is coming out so that we're uh, providing some mixing within the tank. Um, the tanks will have a drain sump on them. And this is how you would empty the tank if you ever needed to. And then an overflow. So you're looking at a slice through an overflow pipe um, on the tank. We're proposing to put two manways. So these are uh, access points that are down at the ground level and we're we're putting two on each tank uh, because what that does is it eliminates a confined space entry uh, issue on the tanks. If we only have one manway, uh, the tank is considered a confined space 
and you have to have uh, additional personnel present and um, um, monitoring equipment and fans and things of that sort. With two, you can open both uh, access manways and it's no longer considered a confined space by OSHA. Uh, this is a roof plan. We'll have an exterior ladder, a roof hatch, and a vent. Pretty simple. And there will also be, it's not shown yet, but there will be a, a hand railing around the top. So when you do climb up to the roof to access the, um, uh, the hatch, um, there's, there's that level of safety provided. And there will also be an uh, interior ladder uh, that, take, that you can climb down to get into the tank if it was you know, open or you needed to get into it from the roof uh, for some reason. All the components that I've indicated are, are proposed to be fabricated from type 316 stainless steel. That's the roof as well? Yes, yeah, the entire tank, the roof, um, the floor, the ladders, the manways, the vents, um, the piping on the exterior, yes, all of it. And what did you say the exterior of the control and chemical building was gonna be? Um, so that will be a, a CMU block building, concrete masonry unit, um, and we're proposing a split face block on the exterior and smooth on the interior. It gives it kind of a nice look to it. Um, you've probably seen these around, uh, and if not, I can dig up a photograph or an example of what a CMU uh, wall looks like or a split face CMU wall looks like. Is that just where you're actually seeing the block itself or is it a faux over the block? No, you'll actually see the block. The, the building is actually made from the, the, the blocks. Right, okay. So it'll be very resilient. Um, it'll be, uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, fireproof uh, with the exception of the, um, the roof trusses. Those would be made of wood the roof itself would be a standing seam metal roof. And I believe this is a similar type roof that's on the K-8 school right now, is that metal roof. I think it's a, a blue color yes. if memory serve. Yeah, so similar in, uh, in look. Um, so here you're looking at the double doors to the, the chemical room, the single door to the um, control room, a window on the back, we're proposing a single uh, a sloped roof as opposed to a double pitch uh, because it's simpler structurally and um, it will help us get through the DSA review, review process more quickly and easily. And we'll have a slight eave on the exterior here so that you get some coverage if it's raining out. And then these are the um, the side elevations, these would be, I think, uh, the north and south elevation views of the building. And here you can see that overhang of the roof over the porch area. Um, these are just structural sections. And this is a structural section of the tank. So this is kind of what the tank will look like. You see the hand railing up here, but this is what it will look like uh, when it's completed. Um, I think we may have one or two extra panels on here. I think the actual tank will be somewhere around here on the height. I don't have a scale on this, I apologize. Um, but then we'll add the additional panels to get it to the full height in the future. And then there's a locking cage on the access ladder um, for security, keep people from getting up. This is a, a section through the tank. So again, you see the ladder. This is the overflow pipe that comes down the tank. And then this is the drain sump and the drain that discharges into a manhole and then it, it or a, a, uh, an inlet, and then it drains out um, off the site to the, towards the swale. And a few other piping features, the roof vent, the outlet pipe. Um, typical CMU details, and then just tank appurtenances, connections, roof hatch, manway, water sampling port, 
liquid level indicator so there will be an exteriors level indicator on the tanks where it will also have a ultrasonic level transmitter inside the tank so this is a it sends a beam or a signal down off the water surface that's what's used to monitor the tank level and turn the pump off and on wall panels the next series of drawings after the structural are like mechanical drawings and you're going to just I'll just quickly flip through them but this is probably the more interesting one which shows the chemical tanks with the metering pumps schematically shown the water the raw water from the wells coming through as it comes through we will will inject chlorine and sodium hydroxide for the pH adjustment their sample port there's a static mixer to mix the chemicals into the water this is exactly what's being done today we measure the flow rate and then the water exits the building and goes into the tanks because the tanks are very close to the same elevation as the building and we're proposing to put a couple of hose bibs outside the building just for some available water we need to put a small booster pump in the building and that's reflected here it's a very small one horsepower booster pump that would supply the pressure needed and that's particularly needed for a shower and an eye wash which is an OSHA requirement for chemical storage to have that shower and eye wash station in case there was an accident and someone got chlorine on them or caustic solution they they could wash it off quickly and we also have to have a water heater because OSHA requires the water to be tepid that is a temperature somewhere in the mid to upper 70s so it's not too cold and you in it and the intent is that you don't jump out of the water if you do need to wash off chemical you can stay in it the water is not freezing cold but it's a warmish temperature and you get that chemical washed off this is the wellhead improvement so we're doing a new wellhead on the test well and on well number two so this just shows the well slab the wellhead improvement the disconnect for the power supply the pump the drop pipe check valve ball valve flow meter and this drawing there will be is the HVAC heating ventilation and air conditioning there will be a small heating and air conditioning unit for the building and the primary purpose of this is to keep the building at a temperature generally between 65 and 67 degrees and that's important because the cost some of the chemicals particularly the caustic solution will crystallize and begin to turn into a solid if it gets too cold if it starts to get below into the low 60s that that chemical will start to crystallize and it can become a maintenance issue so the unit will help keep the building at a fairly constant temperature and then this is the water so water entering the building a couple of hose bibs the pump the shower and eye wash and the water heater and I think yeah here's a detail of the shower so it's got a little pull handle that allows for the water to to come down on the person and an eye wash that they can stick their face down into and step on a pedal and spray the water up into their eyes to get the chemical out if they got it in their eyes and the last drawing here is the electrical drawing so there are some electrical improvements needed we're going to I will need a new PG&E service I think it's a 200 amp PG&E service to supply power to the building to the small booster pump to the three well pumps and the water heater and the lights and I think that's mostly it I've already hit this this last one just kind of points out where some of the equipment will be located in the building the turbidimeter the chlorine and pH analyzer we're going to be checking the treated water 
uh, and the distribution water to make sure that the water entering the distribution system meets water quality standards. There'll be some receptacles inside the building um, and the lighting panels and the well starters. I had two questions. Uh, one, what the water pressure will be in that hydrant that you identified that's halfway between the pump site and the uh, maintenance building. And, and two, what is our current timeline for uh, finance approval and, and construction? Okay, I'll, I didn't quite hear the first question, but I'll ask it again. Um, but the second question, the funding timelines, uh, so right now the plan is to complete the, the DSA submittal and get that submitted to DSA by mid-July. And DSA usually takes about four to six weeks to review a design. Um, we're hoping they will have minimal comments or no comments. And um, at that point, the design is considered final. If there are a few comments, we'll, find, we'll uh, update the comments. Uh, resubmit quickly, get the approval, and then move ahead with the funding application. I'm working with our representative at the Division of, fin uh, of Financial Assistance to um, start the funding application early. Uh, he is reviewing the drawings now, and I'm hoping that in July he'll be uh, happy enough with the progress made on the drawings that they'll allow us to start on the funding application and get that uh, completed and submitted maybe around the same time that we're submitting to DSA. Uh, so because uh, this is important because the funding timeline for construction takes about a year. So we would not expect to see uh, a funding approval for the project until, you know, mid summer 2022. And then at that point, the project would, you know, the district could advertise the project for bids um, and then award and move into construction. So you're probably looking at a late 2022 uh, or early 2023 start of construction, but it will be dependent on the DSA approval and on the funding approval. And I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear the first question. The first question was about the fire hydrant that, uh, the new fire hydrant that'll be between the tanks and the maintenance building. What PSI will come out of that uh, hydrant? Yeah, it's probably not gonna have a very high PSI. Um, it's probably gonna be less than 50. Um, a little bit less than the pressure on the fire hydrants at the K through eight school. I don't think it's a big issue um, because um, what would normally happen in a fire application is that the fire department would come and hook up to that fire hydrant with the pumper truck and pump the water out of the distribution system, boost the pressure and use it to fight a fire. The fire hydrant is intended to serve the new building, which is made of concrete blocks and a metal roof. Uh, the only thing combustible on the building would be the, the wood trusses, which would be interior to the building. Uh, one concern that DSA did raise is that this um, area is a, uh, you know, considered a, a wildland fire area. And, um, you know, I know that fire danger, fire issues, and risk, and water supply are um, on probably everyone's mind these days, particularly as we're moving into a, a, a pretty severe looking summer drought. Um, the intent of this project really is to help mitigate that fire risk, and I, DSA understands that. Uh, the Recycle Water Project, which I'll talk to uh, next quickly here, is, is going to uh, provide additional fire hydrants. I have a couple questions, Matt, about um, energy consumption overall. Um, and it's, it, it sounds like this building is uninsulated, um, correct me if I'm wrong, and what the energy of that heating it, and then if, you've, if there's calculations for the energy consumption of the pumps overall, I don't know if you're aware, but we're, we're in the process of bond work at the high school and we're attempting to go 
uh, zero net energy with photovoltaics, if possible. Is there any chance that um, something like that could be incorporated into this project at that site? So I, I um, it was a, sorry. There's a bit of an echo in the in the room. Were you speaking about like uh, PV panels or some way of providing uh, power offset for the energy demand for the building? Yes, exactly. Um, I well, think not just not just the building, but the pumps as well, because I'm assuming that's probably the greatest consumption, the water. The well, yeah, you know the the yeah the well pumps are not very large. I think they're on the order of about two horsepower. Um, so they're fairly small uh, when, as, as far as like a well pump is concerned. The pump inside the building just to maintain water pressure is about a one horsepower pump and it would not be running very often. Only when uh, someone opens a hose bib to get water out or if the emergency shower and eye wash was used. Otherwise, the, the, the pumps, that pump would be off. The well pumps would be operating kind of on a rotating standby basis. Um, uh, as water demand dictates. The largest energy demand in the building is, I believe, the water heater. And we've tried to select a water heater that is as small as possible, uh, but provides the volume of, of water needed for the shower and eye wash. And really that's a, um, a safety driven um, um, component in the project, uh, OSHA driven. Uh, as far as the opportunity for future solar that could be um, provided, it's not something that the state will fund with the project. But we could look into whether the state would be willing to uh, uh, pay for the improvements um, to or, or the um, components in the electrical system that would allow for a future solar PV. I don't think the PV on the building roof uh, would generate much energy considering the tree canopy around the site, but perhaps you could do a solar array somewhere out uh, in the open area between the tank site and the maintenance building. Is there overall calcs on what the overall energy consumption for the whole project is, or has that not been done? Yes. No, we do have those. I don't have those um, prepared to share with you today, but we have done energy calcs and those will be updated and finalized in the next submittal. Um, and I can, I can probably get that info to you sooner if you're interested to see it. Please. And, okay. and definitely if the electrical work can be done in a way that would allow future tie-in, that would seem prudent. Well, but not necessarily if there's no place on site that you can, you can do it. But sure, or consideration. Offsets I, elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Um, do you have any understanding of what the impact would be on our water supply of, say, a five or ten year drought? Um, like a, a, a water drought of that duration, five to ten years? Yes. You know, I don't. Um, what we used as far as looking at um, drought severity and available water supply is um, what we have for school water use records. And the, the, the year that we're using as a benchmark, I think it was in 2015, was the last real severe drought. Um, a multi-year drought on the order of five years. I, I don't know that California has seen one that's been really bad like that since, say, the 70s. But 2015 was probably just about on par with the drought. I, I can't remember the exact year. I want to say it was 77 or 78. But our goal here is to try to get you know as much storage as we can up here that we can get a, a funding approval for. Um, another you know, consideration in the tank sizing, not just from a fire perspective, but from the potable water perspective, um, because these tanks supply potable water for uh, the schools, for faculty, student, staff uh, drinking, um, we don't want to oversize the tanks such that the uh, water quality may be compromised. If we make them too large, um, you end up with stale water and you can have some water quality issues where the, potable, the water entering the system may not be safe 
for drinking and may require additional chlorination. And we're hoping to offset that issue now with the uh, recycled water project. And I will move into that next unless there's any other questions. Okay, and, and then just for your um, awareness or your understanding here, I, I have an image of what one of these tanks looks like. This is a typical stainless steel, bolted stainless steel water tank. And the company that we've been working with on the design, um, this is the type of tank that they manufacture and supply. The one on this project will be a little bit different. Um, it'll have, you know, the, the hand railing, the overflow will be a little bit different. You'll see an exterior ladder, but it will be uh, on a concrete foundation like you see, and it will be anchored to the foundation for seismic. Okay. The recycled water tank that we're proposing will be of the same design and same material, bolted stainless steel. It'll just be larger. And we're just getting started on that project. So we appro received approval about two weeks ago uh, from the State Division of Financial Assistance to start the design of the recommended recycled water project, which in the uh, feasibility study report was referred to as alternative one. And I have alternative one um, here up on the screen. And let me, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit just on the overall. Um, so if you look on the left is the Mendocino City Community Services District wastewater treatment plant, which is where the Title 22 recycled water is produced. Currently they're pumping that water over to the high school to the concrete tank where it's used to irrigate the soccer field and the, um, the baseball field. That system in this project would be abandoned and uh, disconnected. And the community services district is in the process of, uh, of obtaining the funding to build the chlor a new chlorine contact chamber, chlorination system and booster pumps that will supply the Title 22 recycled water to this system. So in, in the current arrangement, the school district would own this system. The community services district would own the improvements at the treatment plant that pumped the water into the system. So we're proposing a 12 inch water main that runs from the treatment plant up Ukiah Street, Casson Street, and then up Little Lake all the way up to the school district's tank site. And at the tank site, there would be that new 250,000 gallon tank, roughly where I had shown you on the site, we've made room for it. Um, along that route, we've, we're planning for a total of 15 fire hydrants uh, to supplement the existing fire hydrants that are also along that route. Um, the, the potable water um, system follows Little Lake also, um, but it, it comes up to the high school just on a slightly different route here. And um, we would be providing additional fire hydrants down in town on Little Lake, Caston and Ukiah, as well as spread along Little Lake Road, uh, locations to be determined. Um, at the tank site, we would be monitoring chlorine residual in the recycled water for public health purposes to make sure that the water entering and exiting the tank has sufficient residual to protect public health uh, because it will be used to irrigate the school campus uh, fields and landscaping as well as uh, Friendship Park, uh, the baseball field and water for the community garden. Um, there would also be a flow meter here too to monitor um, flows in and out of the tank. The existing potable water that's uh, used to irrigate the K through eight school, the, that service will be disconnected and capped and the recycled water will be uh, connected. The K through eight school, when it was modernized about 10 or 11 years ago, maybe it was 12 years ago now, it was uh, the modernization project installed uh, the, the Title 22 compliant uh, purple pipe and irrigation system 
So the school is already plumbed and ready to go for irrigation with recycled water. I think the only thing that may be necessary is to put up the signage that informs um, the public, uh, the kids and the staff and faculty that recycled water is being used for irrigation. And if you go around the high school play field, you'll notice that there are some new signs that were put up. I think it was maybe three or four months ago um, to uh, uh, provide that, that level of, of uh, information. And that's part of the compliance with Title 22 requirements for use of irrigation, uh, of recycled water for irrigation. Um, so we would, we would connect up to the irrigation system. There's a small booster pump um, that's out here at the K-8 school that boosts the water into the system because the tank relative elevation is not quite enough to provide the pressure needed um, for the irrigation system. As the water comes down the hill, uh, we'll have a pressure reducing valve uh, to step the pressure down as it uh, crosses Highway 1. If we don't put that, the water pressure here in town would be quite high on the order of 130 PSI. Um, and that pressure can damage fire hydrants, or excuse me, damage irrigation systems. Um, we'll provide a new irrigation service for the Friendship Park baseball field and Friendship Park ball field would get a new irrigation system. It does have an existing irrigation system, but it's fairly old. Uh, many of the sprinkler heads are not functional and the layout of the system is not known. Um, so we put a new service in for irrigating uh, Friendship Park ball field and a new uh, irrigation controller and then run a water line over to the community garden with you know, a couple of hose bibs that can be used uh, for irrigating the, um, the community garden plants. Uh, at the high school, the existing two inch pipe that feeds the tank would be abandoned and the tank would be basically taken out of service and the booster pumps would also be taken out of service and the new recycled water line would be connected directly in to the pipeline that feeds the irrigation system. And then we'll need to investigate whether any new irrigation controls are needed. Um, but I think that the existing controls are, um, are functioning fine and, and sufficient. There shouldn't be any need for or anything there. That's the overview of the system that we're moving forward with on the design. Are there any questions on that? There's a couple of details of, of upcoming activities that I'll share with you, and then I think I've um, finished. Well, I wanted to say congratulations today. because you know getting the uh, go ahead for uh, concrete planning is a big step. I mean, so that's glad. I'm glad, was very glad to hear that. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch everything, but I think it was a, a positive remark. It was. I was, I was congratulating you and your team for getting through the uh, next phase. You know, that getting the go-ahead to do concrete planning is, is uh, a big step forward on this project. And that they chose, they agreed with your choice of alternative. Yes, thank you. We're we're pleased with the outcome of um, of the planning phase. Uh, I had shared with you uh, months back, you know, what those documents were and what they contained, and the alternatives analysis that was done. And yeah, we're happy that the state agreed with us on the recommended alternative, which I think is going to be a really great benefit to the not just the school district but the community of Mendocino as well, and provide a lot of opportunity for future expansion of the use of, of recycled water to irrigate other areas of town. I think there's um, a number of, of additional opportunities, uh, including uh, residential use. And it, would it be fair to uh, say that, that the timeline is probably at least two years past the uh, potable water timeline? We're attempting to get the two projects on a parallel path. This project is a little bit behind the potable water project. I'd say uh, maybe two to three months behind the potable water project. Um, but I think it's possible that you could have both projects under construction simultaneously, uh, depending again on DSA approval timelines and 
on the funding timelines primarily. The big, um, uh, the piece that's gonna enable this system is the improvements at the treatment plant. And right now the treatment plant does not have the chlorination system and the pumping system that's necessary to enable this system. And this is a key improvement that needs to happen at the treatment plant. Um, there was a recent project that was, I think they finished com constructing it, that was supposed to have these components in it, uh, but the bid for the improvements at the plant came in higher than the available funding that the community services district had. And so they had to cut these from the project. Uh, I've been working closely with Ryan Rhodes, the uh, supervisor there at the plant, in uh, coming up with a strategy to fund these, uh, these plant improvements and also trying to get those improvements on a parallel path so that this whole system can become operational you know, at the same time and we don't end up constructing this tank and pipeline uh, and then it sits you know, dormant for years. We don't want that. Um, so the next steps that are happening is in the next week to two weeks, our surveyors are gonna come out and do a topographic survey of this entire project area. Uh, they're using LIDAR uh, scanners that are attached to a pickup truck and they basically drive the pipeline route and it does a three-dimensional uh, survey scan of the entire area and that, that data is then turned into mapping and used for design. They also do imagery of the area as well. Um, so that's gonna be happening in the next couple of weeks and then we're also going to be conducting a geotechnical investigation because the segment of the recycled water pipeline that has to cross underneath uh, State Route 1 uh, is required by Caltrans to be installed using trenchless construction methods. Uh, and we're looking at using horizontal directional drilling or HDD. It's the same method that was used to install the water line uh, that the school district put in back in 2009, I believe. So the geotechnical investigation will, we're proposing to put a borehole in the corner of the ball field in Friendship Park. There's a little stairway next at the back of the, the park. So we wanna do a boring there. And then we're um, hoping that the property owner that owns the uh, lovely house on the Northeast corner here of Route 1 and Little Lake will allow us to put a boring in their driveway to characterize the soils on that side of the highway. Um, Putting the borings in these two locations will enable us to avoid uh, the costly and, and time consuming Caltrans encroachment permit and uh, Mendocino County encroachment permit process. Matt, I have to interrupt you for one moment. We ha um, it is just past six. I need to pause to see if we have for a, a item on the agenda, if we have any comment for non-agendized items at this meeting this evening. Uh, Aaron, do you have anyone? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch all that. I, I didn't hear comment or something about the proceedings. I had to pause you for a moment for another agenda oh. item for uh, other comments, but no one has raised any, oh. so we can resume. And I have a couple uh, comments I'd like to make. I don't know how much detail, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, yes. Okay. I don't know how much detail you are at at this phase of the tie-in at the high school area. Um, uh -huh. and, and the tank, but as I mentioned, um, we are starting bond work shortly, and there's a few things to consider, um, one of which is that uh, west-facing hillside, sort of uh, to the north of that tank, is a possible photovoltaic array site. And also, um, I was speaking with our architect, and he was not aware of this project, and he was um, thinking that we ought to use the purple pipe for all the irrigation work. And one, he was unsure if we install purple pipe, can it have potable water in it if it's in service prior to the completion of this project? Um, and I think either way, um, you being in contact with him would be uh, prudent at this time. And Jason can definitely facilitate that. Yeah, think, that's an excellent suggestion, excellent uh, idea, and I would, um, yeah, be happy to speak with the architect. I think it's uh, QKA, 
is is the architect and yeah jason if if you want to put me in touch with them we can coordinate with them on you know an irrigation service for landscape irrigation at the high school as part of the modernization project i think an answer to your question about can you switch the answer is yes because that's what we did at the yeah. k k-8 school right you know we, absolutely we, uh, yes and it, 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 it is very important that, that what we do at the high school is the purple pipe. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions? I guess, you know, uh, I'd like to get a little more insight in terms of how you're gonna bring these, this, the uh, uh, recycled water uh, closer to the, to the timeline that we've established for the uh, potable water. You know, you said it's only two or three months difference, but it seems to me it's, it's, it's more than that. Well, it, yeah, it, it, it could be. I mean, I think it's gonna depend on the time it's gonna take us to complete the design of this project and get the construction funding application in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, when going to construction with projects like these, it's generally preferred to do it in the spring and, uh, and construct through the summer, through the dry months, because you know you don't have um, uh, stormwater pollution runoff issues to manage and deal with during construction. Um, that adds a cost to the project as well. Um, the contractor can, can work quicker. They have more working days, less rain days, and so, while the water project is currently ahead of this one, it may, uh, uh, from a, uh, an execution perspective, may be preferable to have that contractor get started, say, in April 2023, uh, um, and, and then we work diligently to try to get this recycled water project um, on a parallel path that enables this contractor uh, to also get started around that time frame. We're expecting to be done with the potable water project generally by the end of the, the uh, summer, um, you know, with, with a DSA approval likely coming sometime in August or September is kind of what I'm estimating at this point. We're expecting to be finished with the recycle water project design uh, sometime around October and submitting to DSA at that time. So we would have DSA approval, say, by uh, November, December timeframe. Um, so we're, you know, two to three months potentially out on that. Uh, but they, they, we sh even if the projects got started with construction a little bit offset, there could be um, some benefit to that. And that is um, a strategy that I've used uh, for the city of Ukiah on some recent projects uh, some transportation projects that we did where we bid these um, fairly good projects. They were the projects that brought Costco to Ukiah. Um, we bid the two projects about two months apart. And um, the contractor who won the first bid also won the second bid. And um, they were, uh, the strategy is to um, to stage the project such that um, the contractor could already be mobilized for one and would have reduced mobilization costs, which would enable him to have a more competitive, competitively priced bid. And that, that's a strategy I'm, I'd like to try to bring in on this project uh, is to, to stagger the bids by a, a month or two months and try to get, if we can, get the same contractor. You never know what's gonna happen when you bid a project, but um, if we can do that, having one contractor building both projects uh, would, I think, be a benefit um, and make the construction go more smoothly and you wouldn't have two different contractors stepping on each other's toes during construction. Yeah, that's great. I Do you think that uh, we'll get cooperation from uh, the state in terms of making their funding decisions in a timely manner? Uh, you said cooperation from the state, and yes. I missed the second part. 
uh, about their f making their funding decisions in a timely manner? Uh, I hope so. You know, that this is the wild card with the project. Um, what they're telling us is, you know, the funding is competitive. And uh, the funding for the design, the planning and the design for the water and the recycled water projects was also competitive. Um, if the funding is there, uh, we have a very high likelihood of getting it, uh, particularly because the school district is considered by the state to be a severely disadvantaged entity. And that puts you in a better position competitively to get the funding. What this funding relies upon are two things. Uh, one is, is the funds that come from the federal government uh, through the US EPA. And the second is the funding that the state has. It's the, the matching funds that the state provides that comes through the various water propositions that we all vote on periodically. You know, Proposition 1 is one of them that had funded billions of dollars in water and recycled water system improvements. Um, so the sooner we can get the projects finished with design and get the funding applications submitted, the sooner or the, the more likely we are to get approval provided the funds are there. You know, we want to get these plans in and get, get the funding tied up before another uh, city or county or district puts a project in for funding ahead of us, right? And maybe gets the money mm -hmm. that's left. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're hurrying to get it done. I hope that answered your question. It does. I, 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 th I know that uh, it can be frustrating working with the, uh, the various state agencies. And I know you had to make, uh, you know, significant changes in terms of tank design after pushback from them. And, and uh, I, I guess I'm hoping that the pushback phase is done and that they're now ready to say, yes, this is what we said we'd do. Yes, yes, that's right. They, the state doesn't move very quickly. Um, yeah, it was, it was a little frustrating early on um, with the type, the tank type selection, but I'm glad we, we've gotten through that and now it's just a race to the finish line. Good. Well, is there any other questions that I can answer? I think I've taken up a, a large part of your board meeting uh, timeline, but I hope it was time well spent uh, informing you all where we are with the projects. Thank you, Matt. Your presentations are always very informative. I appreciate it. Good. Thank you. I will stop my screen share. And uh, Jason, I'll follow up with you on uh, contact with the architect and I have a couple of action items about future PV and energy calcs for the building. Okay, thanks. Thank you, bye now. Bye Matt. <clears throat> okay, uh, seven reports, Olivia Young. <laughs> so the meeting ended. Yeah, I see. You made him the host, and then he left. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but it's still your meeting, right? So you can restart it? There you go. Hey, everyone's still here. I'll give you a minute. Are you, well, you're, are you still letting people back in? Are they still all in?
Thank you everyone for your patience out there in the electronic world. You didn't say anything, Jason? No. Well, we could. Why don't we just skip ahead? You got your sound back on? I don't think I'm. Do I? I don't think I'm even on that thing. That's a, maybe it's Jason. I don't know. I heard an echo from somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. I was trying to get it back on, but I can't find it. So I was going to give it up. Um, Kim, are you with us? Would you, can we move on to you? And if Olivia sends me something, I will fit it in. Sure, yes, okay. I can go ahead. Um, I'll need screen sharing abilities here. Co-host, not host. <laughs> <laughs> Usually if you, if you click on the three dots above her, uh, go, go, go over to her picture. And then up there, the three dots. It should say co-host, but you just make her host, and then Kim will make, make me host, and I'll I'll give it back. I'll yeah. be sure to do that. That is strange, though, that, that happened, you can't make her co-host. That happened with you and I. There was some reason that maybe Marshall knew. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> the take effect. There we go. All right. So let's see. We have been. Very uh, busy at the Kate, of course. Um, everyone is now back on campus and it's really fantastic to have um, students on campus uh, every day and day to day. Um, overall, students are very um, happy to be here and um, I've heard many requests from the younger students that they be able to spend the night and stay at school all night. So <laughs> it, is, it is nice to, um, to have students on campus and I think it's really been a positive effect for staff too. Um, we are deep into state testing right now, and so we've asked that students come to campus for state testing. We have two more weeks at the end of this week and then um, some makeup sessions. And we've had many students um, opt out of testing. We are at about 19%, and I predict that to be higher as, um, as we roll through the weeks and, um, um, you know, uh, different grade levels testings come up. So. Uh, 21 of those are distance learning, um, students who are distance learning, and 16 are students who are participating in the in-person program. This year was a Healthy Kids Survey year, and so we decided to go ahead and give the Healthy Kids Survey, um, and they altered the survey for distance learning and hybrid models. Um, our students took this when they were in full distance learning. And um, so because it was modified, not all data points were um, given this year. But one of just some kind of highlights, I found it um, very interesting that our academic motivation was um, kind of similar, so on par with the last time, um, given the distance learning and virtual environment. Um, you know, I think it speaks to how well the staff did in both um, the kind of activities that they provided, their lessons, but also in really trying to reach students um, on a level that our caring adult relationships and high expectations were up over previous years. So there's a couple highlights there. Um, this also, um, it was very interesting to see that um, substance use was down overall from previous years. Um, one of the things that we need to still work on is that number there with the chronic sadness and um, hopelessness and also considered suicide, but that definitely has been an increase for us and continues to be a concern. Um, so fifth and seventh grade students um, participated in the Healthy Kids Survey. This is just a year comparison. So this year's fifth grade and seventh grade. And kind of some overall, I'm just pulling out some of the overall numbers. Um, we do, I do have the reports if you're interested in a more in-depth um, look at the questions. And then this is a cohort look for our current seventh graders, kind of their answers in while they were in fifth grade and how they've kind of transitioned to seventh grade. And, um, 
you know, one of the things that I want us to look at and kind of focus on is, you know, what is the difference between um, our fifth grade program and our seventh grade program to produce these numbers? You know, is it just a developmental stage or is there something that we can do to kind of bump up the um, overall percentages here? Um, we've done a great job in increasing those numbers of, over the years, which are the percentages you see there um, on the side, um, but it just um, makes me want to continue to move in that direction. Uh, we have uh, eighth grade promotion coming up. We are going to do an in-person outdoor event um, under our, as the kids like to call it, circus tent out there. So that'll happen on June 17th at 1.30. Um, we are limiting participation in that. Um, that coincides with the guidance that we received about holding um, graduations and promotion ceremonies. So our students receive four tickets to invite guests um, uh, to the promotion ceremony. And board members, if you are interested, please let Jason know so I can make arrangements for you to be there. And then um, I have a couple thank yous to um, give out. Um, the PTO has been super supportive of um, K-8 staff this year, and I know that it has meant a lot um, to everybody. Um, uh, earlier in the year, in the fall, they um, provided gift certificates to Cafe Bougelet and the Good, Good Life Cafe um, to all of our teachers, and that was really well received. And um, uh, teachers are very thankful. And then most recently at Teacher Appreciation, they um, uh, provided house uh, house plants or little um, gifty plants and some treats for them and, and also some really nice appreciation cards. So um, the PTO has been a huge help in keeping morale up and, and it's been really nice to be recognized um, by our parent organization. Um, I would also like to thank Muse. They changed their way that they are um, fielding teacher grant requests this year. And I think overall it has been a positive change and I hope that's something that will um, stick um, out of our COVID situation where teachers can make requests at any time and they're evaluated at each meeting. And I think that has been a, a, a good relationship building and positive move um, um, for you. So thank you to them for doing that. And then I just want to thank the K-8 staff. Um, overall, everyone has done a really amazing job with a really um, challenging year. And um, I just want to thank everyone for all the hard work um, that they've done and, um, and for being very flexible this year. Um, it's, been, it's been a lot and a lot of changes. So thank you to all of them. And then also um, thanks to Jason and Tobin. It's really nice to have a solid team to bounce ideas off in a, in a year like this. So. Um, thank you to both Jason and Tobin too for your support. So, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Percentage of students uh, are still distance learning. That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question right. is, are these students looking forward to attending classes starting in August at school? Or are they still gonna be reluctant to come into campus? Uh, good question. Um, so we have about, um, let's see, I think 18% who are still, um, around 18% who are still distance learning. And I've heard from several parents um, recently, I haven't, um, I don't have any solid num numbers for you. And, and you know, um, I would say three months is a long time. So who knows what will happen between now and then and how their perspective will change. But I've heard from several parents saying that with the availability of the vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds that they are, they do plan to attend um, in person next year. So the hope is that that number will continue to increase and we'll get um, most students back on campus. So um, another thing that kind of coincides with that is that we've had a number of students who have decided to homeschool instead of participate in our distance learning program this year. And we've contacted those families and have heard that they are planning to return if we are full time next year in person. So, are we planning to expand independent study for families that don't feel comfortable coming back? Or we're not going to do distance learning again the way we did it this year? Um, I think that's something that we're still working on um, what the plan is going forward. And it will probably depend on what the state will do. I've heard um, that there is. Um, a movement toward um, kind of in-person instruction and not necessarily allowing distance learning through um, next year. So we'll see how that turns out. Um, 
but you know, I think that's something for us to talk about and consider if we do have families who are not comfortable coming back yet, what are their options going into next year? We've expanded it uh, by 20% so far, uh, but probably uh, we may have to do more. So in, in June, can you give us a, a, a pretty good estimate about what August is going to look like in terms of that? Maybe. Uh, we, we, we'll, you mean as far as how many families want to do independent study or how much we've expand, expanded our program? How I many mean, families we estimate will not be coming back and, and what we're doing with them? Uh, yeah, hopefully we can have that information. Yeah. I mean, can we maybe make that an agenda item? Sure. You can add that at the end or now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions for Kim? Thank you, Kim. Thanks. I never got anything from Olivia. I did. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Would, would you like to read it, Jason? Yeah. So I'll, I'm going to read Olivia's report. And she says, as the school year begins to wrap up, a lot of exciting events have been happening at the high school. The seniors had their prom. We had a Mother's Day CTE fair, and last night was scholarship night. Uh, ASB elections are starting. KAKX just did their executive elections. And the ASB also started a class competition scavenger hunt yesterday that will be going on until June 2nd. Uh, two days a week in person has been great for school bonding and CTE classes. Graduation is right around the corner, and seniors finally get to have it in person. Personally, I can't wait to come back next year with all days a week and my senior year in person. Okay, thanks, Olivia. Um, and you, Jason? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend most of my report um, just reporting on CCM. Um, I asked Peg to give us a re, um, an update on what's been happening, um, so she sent me a report. So I'm sorry for their reading, but I'm just going to read her report. So she says, um, in the midst of CCM's COVID-19 shutdown, some truly amazing things have been happening in our outdoor fitness area. I am bringing them all to your attention because they are now bringing more communities, community members to the center and beautifying and upgrading the MUSD property. The Patonk uh, court, um, it was looking pretty dismal. It was created in 2009 and the benches were falling apart and the soil behind them was encroaching into the court. The Noyo Yoyos and the Ladies Patonk groups worked together to raise funds for the beautification and update of our Patonk piste. I think that's how you say that. They raised money, recruited volunteers and sponsors, and created a new retaining wall and new redwood benches for the court. The group's membership has increased, and everyone is thrilled to be playing on the renovated court. The Mendocino Dog Park was also created in 2009 and was run by the McDog Group until last year. The park is no longer affiliated with them and is now known as the Mendocino Dog Park. This fall, the group raised funds, gathered volunteers and sponsors, and upgraded the park. They replaced the dirt with playground-grade wood chips and added redwood fencing and did a major cleanup. The park is now safer and more hospitable for dogs and much more pleasant for their owners. Uh, the Garden Gate Community Garden. In March of 2020, CCM made the decision to take on the management of the community garden. It had fallen into disrepair and was not being used by the community. One of our ASEP instructors, Patty Parks Wasserman, stepped forward to be in charge of the Garden Gate project. We now have a group of de dedicated volunteer gardeners who are helping with cleanup, a drip water system, uh, building raised beds, installing a new greenhouse, and developing community beds. Patty, who has a master's degree in permaculture, will be offering workshops at CCM on water-wise gardening in June and food forest in July. We are actively searching for shovel-ready grants and donations for the garden. We invite you to come take a tour to see all the improvements. We would also like to schedule a meeting with the facility, facilities committee when convenient. So just to follow up with that, um, thank you, Peg. But first, the, uh, the lease for CCM is up in July, and so I have a meeting scheduled with um, Callie Dim, who is, the, I believe, the president of the board next week to um, begin discussions about a new lease, and then we'll be bringing that to the facilities committee. So, Other than that, uh, the other updates I have would just be are, are part of the open the agenda. So. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments on that? 
Any first questions for Jason? Do we have anyone from MTA joining us this evening? Um, yeah, I don't have a report. Lynn. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Seamus, anyone? Could surprise us. Okay. Um, trustee reports. You want to start, Mark? Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention that we had a, a huge gathering at um, Dave Gross's house yesterday. Dave Gross, if you don't know, was a uh, teacher and principal at the middle school for many years. And so he put out the word that employees from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, were invited to a gathering at his house. And I couldn't count, but there were somewhere between 50 and 100 people there. Uh, former board members, teachers, um, classified. Um, it was great to see everybody. Um, had a great time talking to people, and um, unfortunately, there was some sad news too. A couple of teachers have passed recently. Um, Linda White, who taught independent study homeschool for quite a few years, and um, Ed Merle died last week. Uh, he was a math teacher at the high school for a very long time, and um, that was quite a shock. That's it for me. Um, I uh, didn't know about Ed. I'm very sorry to hear about that. I knew him from the gym. He's a good fella. I have nothing else. Okay. Michael? I'm just glad that we could meet in person. You know, this is a, a good step uh, forward, and, you know, maybe the mask will not be necessary in June, but, uh, you know, it, it's definitely an improvement. I agree. Thank you. Is Jessica with us? No? Uh, nothing for me. Thank you, Wind Spirit. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I don't have anything to report now. I think all the skate park stuff will come up and uh, modernization stuff. So, Did service reduce that. Uh, 9.1, Jason. All right. Um, just to, I think Kim did a good job of summarizing things at the at the K8, and um, I am very pleased to to report. Well, you already know this that the high school went to two days a week. So um, you know, I'm glad that they that that Tobin and his staff, um, you know, really were flexible and and really wanted to put the work in to bring them back another day. And it's I think it's really paid paid dividends um, for for both teachers and and students. So, um, you know, kudos to the, to the high school staff for making that happen. Um, you know, we continue to have zero COVID cases um, on, our, on our campuses, and so I think just that alone has been a huge success. And from what I'm gathering from the administrators um, and from the teachers that I've talked to, that the, uh, the students have been, have been responding to the, the school protocols and the, and the safety protocols uh, really well. They've, they've really taken it seriously, and um, it's just overall been a, been a great, been a great um, experience for, um, for our students. And I've also heard that from parents, that they're very, very thankful for not only our distance learning program, but just the way that we have brought back our students in a very safe way. So um, I think it's been great. So I don't really have much to add to that. Otherwise, you know, other than you know, Michael, you bring up a good point. Is that you know, how much independent study are we gonna are we gonna um, need? And um, it may call, it may end up meaning more staff. And so we should consider that or think about that if we want to do that. So I'd want your your opinion as well, because we don't have staff members that we can necessarily repurpose. Um, we we could look at um, temporary staff if need be. Um, but I'll, I'll be curious to see how many, stu how many families do want to go with the independent study route. And so I think that'll have to be a survey that we do and we can get that done by, by the June 22nd meeting. Um, but like I said, we've already um, you know, increased it by 20%, which isn't much, but it's something. So um, any questions other about the reopening or? All right. I guess have have we lost any students? Do we do we, has have al has almost everybody been accounted for? 
at this point? Well, we, we have. We've, we have lost. Well, 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 <laughs> well we, we know where they are. <laughs> but we have, we have lost students. Um, I, last I looked, our enrollment was 470. So that's down about 50 from last year. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of students moved away temporarily. So I think we're, we're waiting for them to come back. And I think many of them will come back. Like some of them went to stay with family members out of state. And um, so we are anticipating, right now our, our projections are pretty small for class sizes, but we don't feel comfortable, you know, cutting, cutting a teacher at this point because we do think that there many students will come back. But we know where they all are. Have we filled all the certificated positions that were opened? Uh, we, we interviewed a speech teacher today and... Um, so that is, that is one position that we haven't filled, but that is the, the only one that I'm aware of. And we have, we have the temporary positions that are open. We have a temporary uh, RTI teacher, um, potentially two if the high school decides to move forward with one, and then uh, a lot of instructional aid positions. But those just were advertised. And, and those are designed mostly for uh, catch-up uh, academic catch-up? Yeah, so many of those will be um, funded through the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant that we're going to talk about soon. So they'll be temporary. They'll, we'll, we'll keep them along as long as the money is there. Other comments, questions? Okay, okay. jump right into 9.2. Yeah, so the, the high school modernization, things, um, things are looking good as far as the, the phase one in the building. Um, we did receive the huge plans, so if any board members want to see the, the big plans, uh, the one set is at the high school and one is at the district office. As far as the, the big hang-ups right now seem to be under with the, um, the solar project and the um, boundaries of where we were planning to put some solar <laughs> panels. So, um, you know, Mark and Winspear have been on the facilities committee. There's a little sliver of land where the uh, big cypress trees are that is owned by state parks, we've, we've learned. We're still waiting for the final word, but it looks, looks very clear that that's the case. And um, we're going to hopefully work with them to get that kind of, I don't know what the right word is, but deeded back to us or deeded to us. Um, but I think those cypress trees are, are a part of a bigger discussion. And, and um, if we do want to get to zero net energy, we are running out of places to, to put panels. So, um, you know, something that we've, we've expressed is very important. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Wind Spirit or Mark, but that seems to be the big hang up right now. Yeah, I would just say that. that I, I think there are two separate discussions about the cypress trees, and for me, the first discussion is safety. And I, I've heard that people have seen, you know, a branch fall near a student, and um, I can't really assess that. But that's that's my biggest concern, first of all. Yeah. Um. They are kind of two separate issues, and it's um, obviously the, the property line issue needs to be resolved because if they're not on our land, <laughs> we can't do anything with them, except maybe tell parks we're concerned and make them do something. Um, and that's going to take some t time to play out, although we don't have the exact boundary. It's basically what would have been cast in street um, all the way to the main body of parks property which is out beyond the soccer field um, there and shn engineering who we've um, been working with to and they're we're still waiting for their proposal to survey the property but they had recently done uh, work for the sewer district and found out that that was parks land and in fact um, sewer water from russian gulch comes all the way down, I don't know, across uh, whatever that creek is over there and along the roads and up through that piece of land and makes it down to the sewer district somewhere. Um, apparently this was a reciprocal agreement that was made when the sewer plant went in, which actually sits on Parks property, 
with the reciprocal agreement. The trees are definitely um, another issue. Um, personally, I feel that um, clearing some of these large trees in order to make room for photovoltaics is the right thing. And I have various reasons. Um, I know that others um, have expressed other opinions. Um, so I think it's a discussion that we'll have to have. And um, have, who? Have you looked at, at uh, locating the, uh, the solar uh, off of district property? And yes. Would that, would that, would that, you know, could, would that still qualify? You know, in other words, I, I know in Sacramento there was it, it was a big issue because uh, I think it was the utility didn't want to recognize the participation of a school district in this solar farm, basically. I've delved um, somewhat deeply into it, and it's something I don't, the legal jargon net aggregate metering is, I think, the term. You can generate excess power on contiguous properties and get credit. But they have to be if contiguous. They have to be contiguous. If you have it non-contiguous, um, I think it was, we were told that you get something like 20 or 30 percent of the value. Um, so not, financially doesn't make sense. Um, frustrating. And was, I, and, and was not the case, uh, you know, I think not too long ago, homeowners could get checks for basically generating excess, and that's pretty much what we're talking about. And, but that is no longer um, allowable. Only those that already were in that program are grandfathered in. And that's through the California Public Utilities Commission decisions. Um, it's been on my mind to, I've, I've spoken with Ted Williams, about it, I reached out to Sonoma Clean Power, um, was confirmed Tom, uh, no, not Tom Herman, who's our, uh, our energy guy? He was- uh, Tom Willard. Tom Willard confirmed all this, and I pushed back yeah. several times um, and have come around to the same story, because Compshi or Albion could hold excellent photovoltaic arrays, and it would make sense. Um, it, being in California, which in some ways seems to be leading with renewables and insisting that they're allowed and yet not allowing it uh, seems strange to me. Well, I think, it, you know, the utilities have been pushing back very strongly. It, the more solar becomes popular, the more they're feeling the, the uh, loss of income. Yes. And, uh, you know, so that they, they are now proposing to charge homeowners who get solar energy, you know, a fee for the for that one before it was the other way around. Right. So I think this is an issue that expands far beyond our modernization project. Um, anyone that has the motivation to I don't know, call our Congress people, <laughs> or I don't know where exactly to take it, but I think that's. But I guess you know that it, in terms of of uh, your by your I mean the facilities committee committee's recommendation regarding. Uh, you know, the zero energy production part of it. Uh, I think at a certain point you have to say, we know enough that it's viable or it's not viable by a certain point because you can't stretch it out. And, uh, and Stretch out what, the deliberation? The deliberation. Correct, and I don't think, I think we're getting there. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with location, cost mm -hmm. of array. Um, I spoke with Quattrochi just the other day, and he still hadn't, he wasn't considering um, the MCN site as a possible array location, um, which I, I think we ought to. Uh, I brought up the possibility of the slope um, south facing below the, the main building as a possible array site. I mean, we've been, we've been given some maps of pretty much anywhere all over campus. And, and why was the gym roof, for example, not appropriate? It didn't have, couldn't support the weight? I think it's engineering issues with the roofs, I think. Mm -hmm. And maintenance is very difficult. But I think that we were told that the engineering wouldn't suffice. I think in general, roof mount, as much as everyone, a lot of people initially think, oh, perfect, out of the way, is sort of last resort because of the structural ramifications and maintenance. But there's also the aesthetic issue, and I know that uh, uh, 
you know, we don't really want the high school campus to look like a uh, industrial site, you know, covered with uh, aluminum and, and glass and, uh, and whatever. I mean, I say this as, as somebody who's been off the grid for uh, 45 years now. So well, I think that's, that's a very um, subjective opinion. Um, and I, I think that's one, that is one place where MHRB is not necessarily going to have a lot of say. Um, and personally, I mentioned this at our facilities committee meeting, I don't, I don't feel any need to hide the panels. Obviously, I want them to look decent. Um, and yes, we don't want every single square foot <laughs> of open space to have a solar panel on it. Um, on the other hand, I think it's the, getting as much as we can within reason is the right thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, what it looks like, where they go, um, is, um, there's a lot of ramifications. And I mean, how many kilowatts do we need to produce? Has that been de determined? Well, it has. I don't, I don't have Supposedly, but Evan Mills has weighed in a lot with questions. Um, his, his assessments go so far beyond my knowledge of, of this, and a lot of it has to do with the insulation values given to the buildings, how, you know, the numbers they have are based on what we have now, how much is it going to improve. So I think we've been given some numbers, but I think there's questions whether they are precisely accurate or not. That, uh, yeah, I mean, I when when he st when Evan starts going into his <laughs> emails and his descriptions, I I can't keep up. I mean, it's this well, is between Evan. I, I, this is between Evan and Tom and Mark and. But have those uh, insulation values been put into the construction? I mean, we we've already submitted the drawings. If we don't have that insulation in there, it's kind of too late at this point. How do you mean? I mean, they, they well, have, in other the, words, they have if, the proposal. If, in other words, if, if they have code insulation, which I'm not sure what it is these days, R4? R oh, no, it's probably, R30? I don't know, the school. In the ceilings, it's 40-something, okay. I think, 38. So he's probably looking at R100, right? I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't know. No, I mean, he's been given the, the, the plans. I think it's one of these calculations in science against, you know, tires hitting the road. Mm -hmm. How, Experience versus yeah. th theoretical. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with not just that building, but the gymnasium and the other buildings and what will happen to them. A lot of money when you pass a 30 million bond. And when you're building a school, you don't. And I think a lot of the decision making has been based on whether you can pay for it or not. And the fact, for example, that we're using the original two by four studs, we're not tearing those down um, for a variety of money reasons. We didn't start over. We didn't turn it and build a perfectly south facing school that was passive energy, passive solar. You know, we can't do that in that with that amount of money when it costs a thousand dollars a square foot to build a public school, um, your hands are tied to some degree. And I think that's where part of the frustration comes from is that I, I think we do need to recognize number one, we're not gonna be using fossil fuels um, in that building. Um, and that's a big part of it, a big step forward. Um, and I, I, my feeling about solar is um, in line with wind spirit. I, I don't want something that's going to make Mendocino look ugly or something, but um, we need to get real about this. And for me, getting real means um, teaching kids. And that building needs to be their classroom. And what's important to me is that they have um, really detailed um, access to all the uh, metering in that building and are able to manage it and look at which classrooms are using extra and why and what machine is wasting energy and so on. Over the years, I really see that as critical to their education at this point. Um, that's what I'm thinking. I agree with that. You know, I, I, some of that, you know, we, we, 
uh, we had a demonstration solar project, the, the, those panels that are down by the soccer field uh, that produced lots of data, but no one, I think, except for a couple classes a couple times, uh, did much with it. And, and then those panels became inoperative, you know, due to maintenance or some other reason, and they sit there doing nothing. Uh, you know, our K8 panels, uh, I think, are still on target to pay for themselves. But, you know, I don't think we do much teaching around them. You know, even though the, you know, the data is available daily and, and someone could do that, it's a big ask to, to say, you know, include this in, in your curriculum and make projects that are related to our, our, our use here. Um, you know, when I think about the, the, the desire to, to be, to have zero energy contribution, you know, it's not talking about the polluting quality of, of whatever the source of energy is. I mean, you can buy all electricity that's, that's from wind and geothermal and, and just pay a premium for it, not invest anything in, in stuff. But that isn't, that isn't zero energy because you're not producing anything. You're still buying it. Uh, but I really think that, that we shouldn't... Um, be too unrealistic about those cost factors that you mentioned. And that I think, uh, you know, probably the only way to, to, to even do the photovoltaic uh, part uh, is to cut out some of the things that were in the original list of things we were going to do out of the $31 million, you know. Uh, but I think we should decide sooner rather than later about the viability of, of the solar. And I don't think that we, at this point, you know, I mean, I think once you start putting up, you know, the little uh, posts saying, that this is where the solar arrays will start and this is where they'll end. And, and I don't know whether, whether the, when you visualize that, that's something that we want. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that, that uh, it would really change the character of the campus, even though it is a, a learning experience. Um, what, are you, what are you saying? They're going to be somewhere. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that, that I accept what you two have, 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 have uh, uh, proposed. And I don't think the board has made a decision in your favor about that. And I'd, re I'd like to have the board have that discussion uh, as, as opposed to just uh, going on on the assumption that we can absorb the cost of, of being uh, energy neutral. Zero net. Uh, so I've suggested that it be a board decision recently, and I, I do think the five of us do need to go over that. I, I disagree with you, and it'll be a good discussion. Um, and I have to put into this where my head is right now is you know, trying to um, harden my home and dealing with the fact that I'm running out of water and haven't run out of water the 45 years I've lived on that land and dealing with the imagining Jackson State catching fire, imagining Mendocino, the town, burning down. Th these are real things coming into our future. I I'm, I'm not being chicken little. Um, this is this is real life now, and it's certainly real life for high school students. I'm not going to be around that much longer that that it's going to get that serious, but it's going to get really serious, and we have to keep saying that. And I think we have a real obligation to those kids to provide them with an education where they are really in tune with buildings and understand where the energy is coming from and where it's going. I think it's more critical than a lot of what's in the curriculum. Currently, I just, you know, I think that's where we're going. And, and I think, uh, in my mind, you could do it just as well with a project that only did a third of, of the energy uh, replacement that you'd need for zero energy, by provide all those tools and, and not be as much of an aesthetic issue in terms of, of not only the MHRB, but uh, but 
staff and, and students as well? Well, I, th I, I would just, I mean, I think I already made the point, but the aesthetic issue is totally subjective. And, you, and what I'm hearing you say is you're not fond of the appearance of photovoltaic arrays. Or, you, or is it a scale that you're not fond of? I, I think I, I like them better when they're on the roof than when they are uh, shading parking lots and, and uh, covering hillsides. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that, that there's, in other words, I think that there is a balance that we have to make between the aesthetic and, and the practical and the, and the teaching and the, uh, the goals that we have. And I think that it's hard to make, you know, I mean, I know that that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to say, find exactly how much of a footprint do we need, exactly how much can we do in, in this area without cutting the cypress trees, cutting the cypress trees, you know, those kinds mm -hmm. of decisions. But before we get too far into that, I, I think that we should have a more robust board discussion about how far we want to go toward that perfect model. Well, I think mean, we're here. Let's have it. <laughs> I mean, it, it squarely fits in the modernization project. <laughs> well, I, I, that's uh, or maybe not finished it, but let's yeah, continue. I, mean, I, I think we should we should have uh, everybody chime in on it, and and we should also have another discussion when we have more data in front of us with some projections of of what to do it. And I, I, I'm just saying I would rather have that done at a more, uh, at an earlier point than a later point. Sure, well, I think that we've, as, as a, a group of fairly opinionated, educated people, we have discussed a lot of pieces of this and our, our architect has patiently put up with us, but I think we have slowed the project down more than he's used to. Um, in a lot in various ways, which I have I'm not apologizing one iota mm -hmm. for <laughs> um, But I think this That maybe if um, there's I've seen obviously more of the data than you have um, So I think we should probably get figure out what exactly um, We should all see a couple pieces. I'd pretty I'm pretty sure that roof mounted is pretty much off the table I think because of engineering issues. No, I, I can so, understand that okay. that could be true. I'm not. Okay, I, so I think we, I think we, as much as we, want to, some of us may feel mm -hmm. that that's our first choice. Mm -hmm. I think we can take that out of the discussion. Is that your recollection, Mark? Understanding at the moment, yeah. And and changing that would, I guess, main building. I think we're too far down the down the road. Gymnasium, I suppose we could ask what would the structural upgrades cost to allow for roof mount. Um, I think that's a possibility. Likewise, um, the, the wood shop or the, our, um, I call it ROP, CTE, CTE building. Mm -hmm. I don't know about exposure. Um, it's not that good because it's not down. great. Yeah. So those, I mean, that could be one question to take back. Uh, it goes back to Mark's point of cost um, and especially with the open span of the, of the gym I would expect some expensive price tags to create the support, you know, the structural upgrade to support the load. Um, so I, I've been going down the path of roof mount is off the table. Um, if we want to, you know, back up and say, is that not? We've been given, I was trying to find one here. I don't know if you could find one quickly. The map, we've been given maps of possible locations. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's all over the whole campus. A little, little piece here, a little piece there. Um, the costs of even the ground mount, which was supposedly the most affordable, apparently have gone up because DSA has increased their requirements of the structures to hold these things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's ground mount, carport, roof mount. Those are sort of the three categories that were given as options. From what I understand, and maybe correct me if you caught it differently, Mark, mm -hmm. Ground mount is no longer much more affordable than carport. I think you're right. And so I think it then becomes the site, a flat, easily accessible site is going to be more affordable than a hillside, just because the mm -hmm. physical structure. So while the hillside that I mentioned, you know, facing the soccer field is a lovely exposure, going to be a lot more expensive than a, than a carport in the parking lot. I think we should also look at our data from the K-8 school and see how much our insulation is affected by our weather patterns. 
In other words, uh, you know, we've experienced a drop off in production every year, and that's somewhat the aging of the panels, and mm -hmm. it's built into their projections. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think that, that we, can, we, we can do an economic analysis of what we put into the COS K8 panels and determine how much bang we got for our buck before we go down again to another, you know, proposal to put solar panels on, uh, you know, I think that, that there, there are difficulties when, you, when you're t talking about sizing as large as a high school needs. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, um, you know, clear in my own mind that, 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 that the perfect is not necessary and the good is good enough. But maybe you don't agree with that. Um, I tend to be, I think, fairly closely aligned with Mark that um, things are going to hell out there. <laughs> and, and we as stewards of um, a significant amount of money are obligated to make some um, environmental decisions that are the right decisions. And, and that's, you know, again, that's, my, that's a personal opinion. What is the right decision? I'm not gonna say, mm -hmm. what, you know, I can't say what it is for any of you. Um, but really pushing this envelope as far as we possibly can, I, I believe personally is the right decision. And, 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 and my aesthetic is, follows that. So that's why I wouldn't mind seeing more aesthetically because I believe it supports what I believe is the right decision. But here, here's, I mean, you know, and this is, this is a small thing, but uh, you know, uh, the decision was made to eliminate Bunsen burners from chemistry class because it's a fossil fuel and replace it with electricity which is going to use four times the amount of energy to create the same you know heat what well, is that true i don't know yeah. I, mean, I mean the it, electricity is inefficient for that for that use and therefore you know you're you're wasting energy to create the same experience for the greater good of not using a fossil fuel um, and I think that that gets crazy making. I mean, you know, the, 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 there are so many ways we waste energy in our school buildings. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the thing that jarred me most about the entire K-8 modernization was the fact that the skylights default to closed. You need power to open the skylight. Mm -hmm. That's nonsensical. And I could, you know, the, you go by a computer lab and the, they're all left on. You know, the, the, the cumulative waste of energy, you know, and I, I think if we really want to teach students about what it's going to take to survive in, in a world with less energy, and you have to produce it yourself. I mean, I, I've lived off the grid, as I said, for a long time. And I'd say that, that most of what I do is avoiding energy use. Mm -hmm. That's much more effective than producing more energy. Indeed. And, and you know, it involves, you know, trade-offs. It involves sacrifices because you can't do everything all the time, you know. I can't turn my washing machine on whenever I want to. I have to do it at around a time when I have enough solar power to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and th these kinds of things that, that a homeowner can make that decision, and it's a lot harder for a school to say all of a sudden, you know, these are the new rules. Mm -hmm. But I think in, at the same time, that's much more a concrete learning experience that Mark was talking about than just thinking, I can turn on a tap and yeah, I know that, that we're producing all our energy and what great people we are. I, I agree 100%. And uh, that's, and Mark was speaking to insisting on curriculum um, that, that, that supports the, the, what you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. And I've just been having, I was having a long discussion yesterday with Jason about I'm feeling strongly about some shifts in the CTE program to truly emphasize um, real life skills. And with that, um, I th there needs to be an understanding of consumption and all of this. So, you know, we can, this can expand in many different directions. Um, Are we going to have some sort of uh, 
uh, established time to discuss this? <laughs> uh, you where, where, where you can have all the data so we can, yeah. Because I, I, I can clearly see what he's saying, and I can also respect what you are saying, but uh, um, I was thinking to, to come up with an answer, uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to do that no, well, in today's I think, meeting. I agree. Well, why don't we plan on putting it on our next meeting? Um, and I think we can come up with some, I mean, it's all data we've been given. I don't know, I think that Jason, myself, and Mark will concur that Evan has written many pages of emails that go above all of our heads. Um, but by all means, if you'd like to read them all, you should. <laughs> <laughs> and see what you can decipher. And even with, and I, you know, and maybe, maybe you give him a call and have, you know, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk with you, kind of, because my sort of lay analysis is, even from him, well, there's a lot of variables. And, I, and I'm not, and he can't say exactly how much we need in terms of the amount of electricity that's going to be needed. Well, and, and Quadrophy has engineers also who are working with Evan and, you know, they've done all kinds of calculating and it's above our heads. And so that's another level of decision making. And part of this for me is having Mark Quatroki say to us why we can't have 18 inch thick walls. I'm exaggerating, but, um, you know, there are things you can do to further insulate a building, but it's also true that we live on the coast. We don't live in Minnesota, and you know we have the weather we have, and it's not necessarily cost effective to do certain kinds of energy saving things because we have such a mild climate. So it gets very complex, and I'm glad we're struggling with this. <laughs> You know, that's a good thing that we are, and we have made some progress. You know, we're going with heat pump heaters, um, which is, you know, a big change from, from all of that fossil fuel, um, Bunsen burners aside. Um, so this is going to continue to be a struggle, and I don't think we're going to come up with a perfect solution either. Um, you know, we don't have Arizona sunshine um, and so on. Um, but we've made progress, and there are a lot of people involved in this discussion who, from my point of view, seem to know what they're talking about. Um, but even for them, you know, there's a lot of, of back and forth and trying to figure out really complex things. And to figure it out completely. I mean, you're right. These are these are pros that are doing this for a living, and there seems to be a lot of back and forth, and like you said, variables and unknowns, and it's a it's a puzzle. Um, do you want to take any th comments from people? Um, Tobin's wondering if he could make a comment. Yeah, please. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Tobin. Yeah, I, um, Michael, I really appreciate what you're saying. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Are we okay? Uh, Michael, I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, as the teacher that had that panel down by the community school installed and was the one who used it in a couple classes, I always had much more success teaching energy conservation, energy audits um, as a teaching tool than using photovoltaic data. Um, that is absolutely correct. I think everyone needs to remember that zero net energy came on probably three quarters of the way through the design process. It's unfortunate that I know as a staff, we laid out desires for a sustainable site. I don't think any of us understood exactly what that meant or what zero net energy was at that time. But because this desire came on so late, the building is not designed for zero net energy. So to call and to, to plaster the site with photovoltaics and say that we've created a zero net energy facility that is somehow a contribution to combating global warming is in my opinion, putting lipstick on a pig because that's not the idea behind zero net energy. Like Michael says, it's in design. If we are doing the minimum code requirements and then cutting down cypress trees and covering parking lots to make up for that, that's a problem. That is not 
setting a good example. That is not teaching our students how it's done. And I agree with Michael that having a solar panel on a campus isn't going to teach anything. It's going to come down to curriculum and quite honestly, energy conservation is a much richer area. We can teach the physics of photovoltaics. We can do experiments with angles and, um, you know, placement of panels and things like that. The, there is no funding to improve the energy efficiency of all the outline buildings. Yes, the main campus will improve greatly. That is a step in the right direction. But the gym, the tech center, the community school, none of those buildings have funding to make them energy efficient, to lower you know, the energy needs. So to me, it's putting lipstick on a pig. And you know, we're gonna end up with a beautiful site just in terms of energy usage, it's gonna be a little bit of a hog more than we'd like it to be, all right? The idea of aesthetics is important. I agree with Michael on that. I have, there is a school to run and it needs to be a place that is, you know, environment is important um, in terms of how, is, how the school looks, if there's chain link fence everywhere, um, if, you know, the, the layout of the school or the, the uh, is sort of altered for these installations, it is not a small matter. It is important. I don't necessarily have the answers, but it is something that needs to be considered. So um, the other thing in terms of the numbers, there's all, there's all sorts of things that, um, you know, need to be figured out. For example, the energy usage is there, there's no, we're going to have a meeting soon about the, the hours that buildings are used, which could greatly reduce the energy demand and potentially the, the footprint of the, of the arrays. Um, so, you know, there are some technical things that do still need to be worked out, but the fact of the matter is, is that the ZNE idea, idea came up late in the process. It should have been stated from day one. And therefore, the buildings are not designed to reduce energy usage, which is why the, the area of arrays is so much. Would we have had money to do that from day one? I don't know. It's, it's likely we wouldn't, all right? So maybe getting it as far along as we can is the best thing. So I would urge you to listen to Michael. Um, it, I understand the desire, but plastering the high school site with photovoltaics is not going to keep Jackson State Forest from burning. It might keep the campus from being a place that people want to show up to that's aesthetically pleasing and serves the multiple uses that the campus needs to serve. Anyone want to reply? I think I I, I, I see fault in uh, what I heard Tobin say, but again, I think we need to spend more time on this and have the data in front of us. I would want to make sure that we know exactly what data we need so we can clearly request it, because I'm not sure what we need. That's pertinent. Um, I, facilities meeting at some point to set that up and, you know, really grill Mark Quatroki and his team um, and, and try to get some really clear numbers on costs and reasons why, you know, insulation is what it is and, and so on um, so that we can have a good discussion and we have the data. I'm sort of repeating what other people have said. But. Wind spirit? Yes. Hi. Um, my suggestion is uh, rather than a facilities meeting, there's a, a lot of spillover and questions that come through to the actual board meeting. And given the importance of this um, conversation and the investment um, the community and the board members have in this discussion, I really think this warrants some type of special board meeting, town hall kind of event, 
because I think if it's another facilities meeting, we're going to end up with a lot of discussion at a meeting that leaves us with a lot of questions. So if we can have maybe Mark come and speak with the board at large um, in an open meeting, uh, I think I think that might be where we can move forward on some of these discussions. I think it would be important to clarify what the decisions at hand are before we spe schedule this special meeting. Um, I'm ha where I'm, I'm not, I have no problem hearing input on all sorts of topics, um, but in le it, it, it's critical to um, focus it to some degree so we know what we're trying to get input about and what decision we're moving towards. Um, and possibly, I think it makes sense at a facilities committee meeting that we could maybe try and figure out those decisions clearly and maybe have some back and forth via Jason with the, with the rest of us um, and whether it's a special meeting or at our next board meeting just to agendize it. I think that would be a reason. It might make sense to have, to Mar have Mark Quatroki here, to have Tom Willard here, to have Evan here, to have Ted Tiffany here, Zooming. Mm -hmm. to have them all here uh, rather than just rather than getting data and bringing it back to you that's that's not going to answer you're, you're going to have more questions i bet so to have them here i think it would be worth the money i agree i, agree I think we should be clear what question we're trying to answer in that type of meeting mm -hmm. in other words are we trying to answer the question uh how many megawatts of solar panels do we want do we want as much as we'll cover the entire electric usage of the high school. I mean, that's fairly, we know what we used in past years, so we can establish what, uh, a range of what. That's been the tentative working right? process. So, yeah. so you know, uh, the issue is then storing that energy, are you just going back to the grid with it? You know, are you going, you know, most solar uh, installations are designed for less than 100% of, of uh, power because they don't want to get paid. You don't want to waste any, right? You don't want to give any away. You don't get paid anything if you, use, if you produce more. Um, but I think those are, are, are pretty finite things. And then, then, then the, the other question would be how many square foot of solar panels would be needed to uh, meet that? demand. Mm -hmm. And then the third question is, is, does the campus aesthetically support that amount of square footage? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, they, all the consultants we have have pretty much been working on those points you exactly mm -hmm. made. And I think what uh, we've been told is, these are what we need. We're not sure if we're going to be able to fit it on the site. Here's where, here's, here's where we could see them going. What do you all think? <laughs> is sort of where we've gotten to, um, and then some some discussion, and then of course the property issue came up, which threw a, a sort of large wrench in those discussions, um, and uh, I, and then I guess the the other part is the energy efficiency part of the building. I don't I, I don't I would like to hear Mark Wachowski's response. I don't think that Tobin is exactly accurate in his assessment of the building. I think that the energy efficiency of the building is going to be brought up significantly. Well, yes, a brand new structure could be even more energy efficient. It could be cited precise. It could be you know shaped in such a way. But that, I know was, that was brought up in our, in our very beginning meetings. Was we talked to uh, Mark well, about energy well, efficiency and the yeah. design. Of well, that. we talked about energy efficiency. We didn't talk about zero net energy. I think those are that's what he was saying. That's that's a big difference. Yep. Right, but in terms, regardless of the source, increasing the insulative value of the building yeah. is is important. But I think ZNE is such a buzzword, you know, that yeah. ZNE means it's very specific thing, and we didn't say that right away. No, we did not. Although I, I personally, I think I've said this, I think that I know that Mark and myself both were very clear about wanting energy efficiency, yeah. and I think yes. Mark didn't fully hear us yeah, for a that's, while. That's accurate about the first meeting or two way back. Um, I think he did hear us, but I, at that point there was more of a view of you're on the coast in the fog. And um, to some extent that's still true, but 
Um, I think ZNE is is a great thing, and and if you can do it, great. I don't think it's it's not my top priority. Yes, I would like to. Inst I you know, I don't want to have um, solar panels turn into a huge town fight or something. Um, uh, that's not my top priority. My top priority is basically, you know, I agree with Tobin that the most education is going to come from those kids looking at energy usage um, and counting it and being aware um, down to the microchip level, which apparently you can do now. Um, that was part of um, Evan's project with his son. Um, those are things all people need to understand now and pay attention to on a daily basis. Um, and that we can do. Um, if that's not so cost, not so expensive. And getting rid of fossil fuels on campus, we can do. I don't want to debate about Bunsen burners. That's a trivial, very small part of the issue. Um, but switching all the heat away from um, fossil fuels it was the biggest step to me and the most important. And you know, I would stand on that line. I, that, that I would fight for. And, and I think it's going to be required of all buildings in the state within the next 10 years anyway, so. And, you know, it is late down the path, but it might not be too late to make additional energy upgrades to that top of the hill. You know, if, if, it's, if it's agreed that that makes more sense ecologically, uh, teachably, however, than more photovoltaic, you know, that's, that's a discussion I'm open to have. We're pretty far down that path. I, I might recommend that we, we stick with the, the June 22nd board meeting. That would give us enough time as well. Um, the June 22nd board meeting to invite those four, but in the meantime, let them know exactly what we're looking for mm -hmm. in advance. Those three questions that we've been working on that you just asked, Michael. You know? That sounds, that sounds like a good plan to me. Yeah, that's good. And back to the land thing, that's a big component that is going to take a year, maybe more, to resolve in our favor if poss if, if so. Um, if, if we want to use that location, which I think within the meetings of the architect, the consultants, and the facilities committee was considered one of the favorable from cost-wise and consolidating it into one location. Um, but it was going to require removal of some or all of that row of Cypress. With the roof yeah. being the solar panel, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to acknowledge another thing Tobin said at a past meeting, which is um, that we need to take account of wind. Um, wind can be a very unpleasant thing on a high school campus. You know, it, it's like chain link fences in a way, mm -hmm. and I don't understand the 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 wind tunnel aspects to those trees and so on. Um, I'd rather have a windy campus than a student crushed by a branch. Uh, that needs to be addressed. But um, you know that is another issue we need to think about. Okay. Well, I think um, we're clear on agendizing this next month, um, when we're in clarifying our questions for the folks and inviting them all. Yeah. Okay. Again, I think that, that if you meet and and gather this information and disseminate it in advance of the board meeting, it will give at least us the opportunity to go over it instead of hearing it the first time. Yes, 100%, I agree 100%. And it's all, it's all been generated. We can, it can just be maybe consolidated yeah. and re-disseminated. Yeah. Re I think easy to read would be critical and to understand. Well, some people are gonna delve in deeper um, and, and <laughs> others are gonna wait to the meeting, I guess, to hear the, <laughs> to hear the uh, you know, the overview. Yeah. Uh, 9.3, MUSD skate park update. I guess I will start with this one. Um, myself, Jason, um, Andy, and four or five students, I think, showed up, met um, once, and then the three of us, and I think two of those same students met a second time. Um, very excited students about having somewhere to skate. Um, Andy motivated to help them. Um, 
we discussed um, their interests, uh, what what that what a skate park might look like. There's all sorts of variables. Um, there was discussion of possibly Andy building a smaller wood type, um, what they would call a half pipe structure, um, which is a much less um, cost investment, time investment um, component versus something out of concrete, typically skate parks are. Um, he, and, and then, and he was, he was very excited at first to do that sooner than later, um, and then realized where he was in, his, in the time of year and backed off. Um, at that first meeting, we agreed, um, I, I suggested that, we, that uh, the one of the first questions was, if we were to pursue something like this, where would it be on our property? And I think we unanimously agreed that somewhere um, at the Friendship Park, um, Old Middle School property made the most sense. And so we agreed to meet there the second time, or possibly, you know, and so we uh, met there and walked around and looked and talked um, and had some various ideas. Um, Jason had to leave part way through. We would, we, um, and so some of the, I think some of it for me dovetailed into um, the discussions with CCM. When I was there, I um, took a look at what's going on there. The property, you know, they're, they're barely managing to keep things maintained. The Dog park people are very motivated to keep their dog park looking lovely. The Patonk people are very motivated to keep their Patonk court very nice. Um, and the rest of the grounds are just barely limping along. Um, there's a lot of asphalt there, um, partic you know, all the way right up to the building and all the way up to the below Friendship Park. There's that, the old, um, well, somewhat, all the, when I was in, the portables were all out in the field to the south and east. Oh, okay. And where the playground is. Mm -hmm. so the community school was in one, two, three, lined up along the playground, a couple more out there in the field. The only one that's left is the Aikido building, and that was one of the ROP portables at the time. There's that funky old square thing that apparently was the top of the tower at one time, and it sits right in the middle of the asphalt, right behind the community center building. That's the condemned shed. Conde yeah, <laughs> condemned shed that has some uh, CCM staging of things <laughs> in it. My um, personal opinion was if anything was to be built um, in concrete that on that site, that's somewhere in there, made the most sense. Um, while we were having the discussion, Peg came out and um, that's what we were doing, <laughs> and I, I filled her in a bit, and uh, we talked for quite a while, actually. There's, and she pointed out some regulations around the, um, uh, not childcare, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, preschool, the, or no, uh, the after school after program? school program, yeah. and restrictions on proximity to adults with those children, and it's something like 50 feet unless they're escorted by an adult. Um, so that could be a potential issue if something was done there. Um, beyond that, I guess back sort of on the CCM, the Patonk folks did some significant concrete work um, there in, on, their, on their Patonk court in a retaining wall. I don't think they probably got a permit for it. Um, <laughs> makes me... Or permission. Either. Or permission. <laughs> and so it makes me think, and with this lease coming up, that it's important to consider what arrangements CCM is making and with whom and whether it makes sense. Um, and if, well, I, well, clearly the Patonk folks and the dog park people are, are very um, you know, the, the supportive of what they're doing. Does, does it serve our goals? Does it serve the children? Is it the right thing to be going on there? The Patonk court actually predates CCM. It was one of the last things that happened under park and RFP. management. Uh, or, they, oh, they got a grant right. from uh, the state built one here and one in Fort Bragg. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think that that's something that... Um, and I don't know whether we had to sign some documents at that time, you know, because usually state money comes with uh, a use for a certain period of time, so you'd have to look into that. Mm -hmm. Right, Peg mentioned some grant money that was given and that supposedly 
um, Parks and Rec ran off with half of it. <laughs> She wasn't too happy about it. Anyhow, that's sort of a side topic. We agreed to meet again. I, um, I was encouraging via Andy for the kids to look into um, what kind of features they might want. Um, if something happens, it's not gonna be one of these $2 million skate parks. It, it's just, I know it's not realistic. Um, so um, nothing in stone, but uh, it was neat to see the kids real enthusiastic. I think um, at the very least, if Andy's still motivated, um, I will see if we can agree to let him build a wooden half pipe down on that concrete, which would be totally portable, totally movable um, early next school year. Um, it's, he seemed excited to do that with some of those kids. So if he still has that interest. Um, so any, anything else, Jason, on that? Well, my, my role was to look into insurance and um, remind me what SIR stands for. <laughs> yeah, it, because it, it says that they are not... They are, they are considered, you know, a dangerous sport, and it's, although they're not excluded from coverage, you can have a skate park at a school site, but they're subject to a $10,000 higher SIR in the event of a claim, so. Single individual. Well, it's, it's a little. The first $10,000 we pay, and they would pay. Yeah, so I consider that the deductible, I guess maybe as a, another word for that. Um, you know, they're not, they're, they obviously discourage it, but I don't think they would ever say no. Um, they're, they're, they're not recommending it, they're discouraging it, but they, they will not say no. Um, it's just something that we have to take on as something more. And we, we already discussed that for the pump track, and then when we discussed the skate park that Shane was going to help put in, um, we already said yes to that. So, you know, I'm, I'm very much in support of something for these kids. So... I mean, I'd like that. I, I would like the students to stay involved and, and really follow through with some features and well, you know how how much square footage might it might it look like might, might it take and um, start looking for some funding, some grant funding. But it's fun to see these kids excited. To, you know, that that group of five, they were really excited at that at that first meeting, and it was really fun <laughs> to see them just getting into it. Yeah, I remembered one other thing. I um, encountered a. Uh, old classmate of mine who had, I don't skate, but he was a skater, and I asked him, are you inter any interest in helping? He was very bitter. He, <laughs> he was involved with the efforts to fundraise 20-something um, years ago. Um, said they'd raised, I forget what he said, thirty or $40,000, I think, got as far as a proposal in front of MHRB, and wanted to do it down there at the um, community center site, um, and felt like no one on the district or MHRB was really in support, or excuse me, on the Parks and Rec, or the district gave a lot of support, MHRB poo-pooed it, and then the project in Fort Bragg happened, and they gave all the funding to them. So I, he, I said, well, fine, I won't, uh, <laughs> we won't get you involved. This stuff. So I would imagine if it got to the point of some funding of being available and wanting to put some concrete in, um, we would have to go in front of MHRB mm -hmm. for it. So, anything else? Okay, uh, 9.4 Oversight Committee update. What, just when did you decide to meet? Two weeks later? Yeah, we, yeah so that would okay. be uh, Friday after okay. next. All right, so the oversight committee update, um, the, the time frame for uh, the, the application period is over and we did not get any applicants. So um, I did then post something on the community listserv, on the announced listserv, asking for um, exactly what we needed. And um, I did have one person respond. Um, I believe he's a senior citizen. I'm not sure he's uh, active in a senior citizen's organization. So, you know, he might be um, uh, at large community member. But other than that, um, I've not heard from anyone. Um, so I guess, I guess the next step is to um, try to go out and recruit, if that's how it's supposed to work. Um, and so... You know, I looked on the website, it's, it's, it has the blurb and then it has application time and it's passed. Yeah, so wouldn't it would be prudent? I would think to amend that and say no one's applied. We're going to be actively pursuing well, yeah, something I mean, to not suggest. Oh, that's done. Well, no one's no one's. I don't think anyone's looking at the website as far as that spot. As far as I don't think they're clicking on that. Um, but I, I think what I need to do um, is go through this list and just 
I mean, I don't even know what, okay, what, so what senior citizens organizations are in Mendocino? I guess I don't, I guess I don't, I don't know where to start. I mean, where, where do I find a taxpayers association? So, so um, the, the largest taxpayer organization in California is the Howard Jarvis Group. And they have something like uh, 500,000 out of 31 million Californians who are members of it. I don't know that that means they do anything other than pay dues, but. Yeah. Well, would that be a, the taxpayer group, that would be a state registered organization? I think that's what they're looking for. They want to make sure that some. I mean, so I'm getting at is, could, is there an office at the state that you could contact to say, I want a list of all the taxpayer groups yeah, by, there might that, be, are, that are active in our county or something? It, I don't know. You know I, th I think that, that uh, if you send an email to the Howard Jarvis Foundation asking them, could they recommend a uh, Mendocino Unified District resident mm -hmm. to uh, serve on the committee? We're doing outreach because we haven't been able to fill that position. Uh, senior organizations, I think anything from AARP to the belonging to the to one of the local seniors clubs, oh, I see. Yeah. you know, probably qualifies. The do you want to go down? I mean, do you want to go down the list? A lot of seniors aren't members of Lynn? AARP. You know. Lynn? Lynn? Um, how, how about if we reach out to some of the organizations like Seraphimus and Rotary and let them know that we are needing to uh, move forward with this and see if they can support us. Yeah, I was just thinking that. I mean, maybe all the local groups, maybe the fire department, uh, the sewer district, I don't know, any, <laughs> any organized group around here. The last time we had one, we had, we recruited at least four of the seven people from uh, our parents' site councils. Well, so I was gonna say that, that I, 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 I think, I, <laughs> Yeah, one member of a parent or guardian, so one's a parent, two at large, and then another one is a member of the site council or the PTO. I, I can get those people. It's the other three, and then do you need seven? Uh, these are questions that I just don't know. Wait, um, only if they vote and a vote is split, so, you know. So I we can go move forward with, let's say, five, I'm, I'm wondering. You can start with five and okay, have two vacant seats. I believe I can get the parents. Mm -hmm. What are the three most it's challenging the, ones? Um, uh, one member active in a business organization representing the business community. Uh, senior, one member active in a senior citizens organization and one member active in a, uh, or a taxpayers association, in a bona fide taxpayers association. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what about the Mendocino Coast Chamber of Commerce, contacting them? To find yeah, uh, I mean, I know, I know various business folks. Um, but they have but to be in the organization. They can't just own a business. That's true. Right? No, that's, true. that's true. reads. That's true. Yeah. Plenty of business owners. But that's are they, true. Are they in any organization? That's a good point. But most business owners are members of Chamber of Commerce. Okay. So that, that's the update. I guess I, you know, that's, that's my next step, and I'll, I'll work on that. Okay. Well, you can delegate that. I just don't know who I would delegate it to. <laughs> Put three or four <laughs> names in a hat and, and, and pick uh, one out. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. I'm too nice. <laughs> one of those, uh, one, yeah. Okay. All right. But I do, um, you know, I, I heard, I want to be very clear that I heard Jessica loud and clear last meeting that this is very important. And it is very important, and we're already behind on that. So I, I'm really hoping, um, you know what, maybe if we could put it on the June agenda again, just sure. to, to, li to light a fire. I think we should roll it over. <laughs> okay. Jessica, do you remember how long it took the hospital to get their committee? Organized? It happened very quickly. People were interested in overseeing that money, the Measure C money. You know, because they, you know, parcel owners and it's a parcel tax and they were interested in it, making sure the money was spent appropriately. Well, good. So um, I, I do think, I, I didn't quite hear all those responses. It's kind of garbled, but um, organizations like the Rotary, uh, Jason, I don't know if you, uh, still present to them or have a relationship, but um, you know they take this kind of duty seriously along with other organizations, and they probably have some people who have a lot to offer. I agree. Okay. Uh, well, so 
but also, there, I'm, Marshall's telling me that there's a, there's a sweet spot, that if you get too close, it gets a little. Right here. Am I there? Right there? Yeah. Perfect. I'm not going to move. Don't move. 9.5. This is an action item. Any discussion of this? Would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, uh, no, we, only a portion of it was pulled. The amended 9.5, the uh, first the first sentence referring to, or the portion referring to MTA was pulled, so we still are moving on the CMUS portion. And the uh, third part, the uh, certificated and classified management group. Correct. You got that, Aaron? I'll move that we approve the disclosure. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? No? Okay, please call the vote. Aaron? Dean Trustee Young? Aye. Trustee Greenberg? I'm just confirming this is 9.5, correct? Okay, yes. Paper? Yes. Trustee Morgan? Yes. Trustee Gay? Aye. Aye. Thank you. 9.6. This is the ratification of superintendent's employment agreement. This is also an action item. I move that we ratify the superintendent's employment agreement. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Any further discussion? I just think we should, you know, since it's not everybody may have. Uh, read the, the document that it's a four-year contract and the initial salary for next year is, I think, 138500 There's actually a th three-year agreement, and, but there is a typo, and I was going to mention that. Um, it says it's a period of four years, but then the, it says it's terminating on 2024. So... It's a three-year extension. It, okay. It, it's a... Th so this is a... Th three-year agreement though yeah you're right so starting next year okay so so if you could just amend you know approve with maybe we could amend that to say three years it's just a typo because no, it says it, four it, you know we should make clear it's three years it's a three year yeah okay. noted i think everyone's okay with their mo their motion and their second oh. okay did you want to discuss it more michael no Okay, please call the vote, Aaron. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Aye. Okay, 9.7, 2021 through 24 triennial plan. This is a, this is a plan um, for um, expulsion, or expulsions for providing educational services for expelled students in the county. And so what this does is it allows us to place our, any student that we expel in um, local programs, and the, the most local program we have is Fort Bragg for seventh through 12th graders. And in turn, Fort Bragg can uh, place any student they expel in 10th, 11th, or 12th grades in our continuation school. So we're, this is a renewal of an existing Correct. program. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve 9.7 as written. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, please call Aaron. Young. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Aye. 9.8, expanded learning opportunities grant plan. Okay, so are you gonna, am I sharing this? I can share it. Oh, you have it? Okay. All right, so this is a um, slightly amended. Um, I emailed the board today. I have copies if you want one. Um, it's slightly amended because uh, I knew that I was meeting with the high school staff yesterday and um, but I needed to get it in the board packet for you a week early. So there's just a couple of slight changes. 
So if you could just go all the way down. Um, oh, so let me explain to you what this grant is, first of all. This is a, it's called the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant, and it's really t um, meant for school districts to receive money to target uh, potential learning loss in our students and um, to provide an intervention. So we are allotted $335,000 for this plan. We have to have a plan. It has to be approved by the board and submitted to the state by June 1st. Um, so I so see you can just go down a little bit. To, and so I'll just read some of this. So it, we are allowed $335,000 for this. Uh, 31,000 of it has to be spent, at least 31,000 has to be spent on instructional aids. So we easily cover that. But I met with the high school or the K-8 staff uh, as well as Seamus uh, leadership on April 28th. I listened to, uh, I went to a, a P PTO meeting and the high school staff and, get, and got ideas for the plan. Um, you can go all the way down to the expenditures. That's, be that's probably the best way to explain what's happening here. So the, for the first one, um, so these are categories that I have to work within. So the money here is, is very, it's very, very specific what you can spend this money on. So the first one is extended instructional learning time. And the plan here is to have a summer program in the summer of 2022. There wasn't a lot of interest in having a program this summer uh, for a couple of reasons. But um, I think the most important reason is we will have a, a better idea of what skills our students are lacking and we could um, have ex uh, provide the academic interventions during the following summer. So. Tentatively, I'm, I'm thinking about a four-week program for four hours a day, uh, four days a week, uh, and so I'm, and we have to provide food in there too, so I'm ballparking $30,000. I worked with Meg, our, our new business manager, on some of these numbers. Um, so the next one is accelerating progress to close learning gaps through the implementation, expansion, or enhancement of learning supports. So within this $150,000, I have professional development, additional aids at the K-8. So we are looking at um, uh, an aid in every classroom and also a social, work, a social worker aid. And then um, additional aid times at the high school and then an additional RTI teacher. And I met with the high school staff, and um, they may be interested in an RTI teacher as well. And if that's the case, um, I still think that that figure is going to come close to, to um, covering that expense. And we can move money around as necessary, because you can see we have planned and actual expenditures. Uh, the next category uh, is to, to address barriers to learning. So um, I would like to provide scholarships to the after-school program. We are gonna contract with a, the Mendocino Coast Youth Project to work with high school, the high school students and then some additional counseling. The next one down is uh, we are hoping to go one-to-one -one Chromebook for uh, all students. We currently do it at the, at the high school, but we're, we're hoping to begin moving towards one-to-one -to -one Chromebook deployment for K-8 as well. I don't know if 40,000 will get us there, but it'll, it'll, get us, it'll get us pretty close considering that we already have quite a few Chromebooks in place. Yeah. I asked our primary teachers and they said that they would, they would like to, they think that they, they could use these, so. Um, but we'll probably work from the top down. All right, so I'm gonna go down a little more. Next one is supports for credit deficient students. Um, here we wanna hire um, a Sunrise aid. Uh, we had the Sunrise program, I think we had 12 students in it this year, and we're graduating six, so um, I think there's a need there. And then 20,000 for universal screening and diagnostic tools, teaching materials, curriculum supports, um, college exam and AP test preparation and support, whether that's through tutoring or supplies, and then um, general professional development for staff. So. You know, all of that adds up to 335, and um, we will hopefully get what we spend. It's all estimates at this point. But this is where a lot of our, our temporary positions are going to come from. Well, this is state funding. Yeah. And we, we spend and then submit for reimbursement? 
Um, I believe once the plan is approved, we will um, have the money available, and then and then we will get. Yeah. Well, no, I think I think, I, I, I think we'll get it. But if we don't then, spend it, we have to give it back. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure, and there may be an audit involved. Any other questions? Okay, I will uh, move to. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask a question, you know, please. And, and that is, um, how are we prioritizing our funds that, that we're spending for the targeted groups, you know, which are low-income English learners, foster youth, homeless students, students with disability? students at risk of abuse, neglect, or exploration, disengaged students. It seems like these are pretty much uh, across the board uses of the, of the funding. Yeah, I, I mean, I think when you, so I think, can you go down just a little bit, or up a little bit? So I think the, the summer programs are gonna help. So yeah, I mean, it's available to all, but I think the uh, additional aid support and the RTI support, the social worker aid, um, I think the uh, additional counseling, uh, the Mendocino Coast Youth Project worker, those are all gonna be targeting our underserved or our underrepresented groups. So they're, that's, that's, that's who they're gonna be targeting. Even though all of the, these, this will benefit all students, that's, that's the target of, this, of these funds. Does that make sense or not? I, well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to, to say that there's sometimes a gap between uh, you know, the, the, the same people who are, fall through the cracks, could fall through the cracks on this unless there's a really concerted effort to identify those students and prioritize help for them. And we're a small enough district that we ought to be able to do that. Well, I think we're doing that. Okay. I mean, students? I think I think we're you know every single student. So I mean, every single student's going to receive the universal screenings and and get the uh, assessments in the fall. But I think that you know once we have that, um, I, we are small enough, and I think that they're not going to fall through the cracks because we have more support. You know, if if we don't if we don't have enough support then they, they might fall through the cracks. But with this, we have such an additional, you know, additional aid time and the social work, the social worker aspect of it and the youth project worker. Um, after school program access, I mean, that's, those, are, those are scholarships for low-income families, you know. Those, those, those are definitely geared towards those students. I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but it's just, it's not gonna be, I mean, for example, I don't see in here uh, an increased assistance to our ling English learner families. Well, that's being built into the LCAP. And we are, we, we did hire an LCAP coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I, actually, I think she is in, in here um, as the additional counseling. She's under the additional counseling. And so part of her job is to be the LPAC coordinator a dedicated LPAC coordinator. Um, and then, of course, we already have, um, with the additional RTI <coughs> teacher, that's gonna free up our current RTI teacher to do more of the EL services. So maybe I didn't make that very clear. Maybe I, I should put that in there maybe more clearly. Well, uh, and, or maybe this is something that you can report on at, at some point, either by through email or at a board meeting. But, you know, if I have a hard time what our total package of support is for English learners. And if you could put that in, in, on a page of paper, it would, it would help me. Okay. I mean, they received, our English learners received um, in-person supports right along with our students with disabilities the entire year this year. They, they were brought in for in-person support. So, I mean, that's 25 students yeah, I mean, those that took advantage of it. And do we have any testing results about how effective that was? We don't have the results yet. 
they were, there was no LPAP testing last year. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the results yet for this year. We just finished up. I mean, it would be nice to have data on, on the effectiveness mm -hmm. of what we're doing. Yeah, and, and that's going to be a part of the LCAP. That's it's a very it's going to be one of the the goals that I wasn't happy with in the last three years. Um, I, I would like to look at individual students and look for improvement rather right. than just as general. opposed to cohorts. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's going to again, be a, we're small enough. We ought to be able to. We should be able to measure. We should be able to look at every <coughs> single one of those twenty-five students and see that all of them are improving, and that's going to be in the LCAP this year. Right. Because that was one of the goals that was not well thought out. Mm-hmm. Or at least the the metric. And I I think it at it's sort of another uh, range, you know, uh, identifying high school freshmen, and you know I know as part of the advising process, there's always the uh, you know route to college kind of of uh, uh, choice that's involved. But again, it's it's sort of uh, with these categories of students, we need to be doubling down and, and trying to eliminate obstacles as they come up in that in their pursuit of whatever goal that is, whether it's vocational or, or educational. And and uh, you know sometimes I, I I don't get the sense of how specific that is. Mm -hmm. You know I get the I get the big picture and 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 the words without any yeah any sense of of uh, what it how that is actually changing things on the ground mm -hmm. and what, you know, why spending that additional money made sense. Mm. I, I, think, I think this aside, I think the freshman seminar and the get focused, stay focused curriculums at the high school are helping kids identify their goals and, mm -hmm. and you know, they, our, our staff meet with them in tutorials. Or no, their, I, I, their, I understand their, we do that and I understand, and I you think know, that the value of making the, you know, the, the three-year plan, the five-year plan, the ten-year plan. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that, that what this extra funding calls upon us to do is to, to take some of the people who are not responding uh, optimally in, in, that, in, in that kind of uh, uh, prodding, you know, give them some extra, extra help. That's what I think this funding is designed to do, and and that's what I'd like to see the, the proof of. Okay, I mean, I, I think I mean I think I mean I have it in here. You know, I I really do believe that the additional aid support at the continuation school, the family resource center, um, and more one-to-one -one intervention is going to support those families. But I see I see that I didn't I didn't specifically call them out as that's the the target, and maybe I should have. I mean, you know, our LCAP uh, funding is more than this, more than 335,000, right? It's about closer to 400,000? I don't know what it is this year, but anyway, honestly, it's, but it's, it's close. It's between it's, two and 400,000. It's, it's a substantial amount of money that we're spending, and, and I don't see how we can evaluate how well we're spending it if we don't, if we don't have better information. Well, I agree, and remember this 2017 through 20 LCAP goals admittedly were not very good, the, the things that we were measuring. Uh -huh. So I'm hoping to make it, to simplify that a lot this year and just, or in the next three years and have very clear metrics of what we're measuring. I mean, I think that, that we need to establish, it's, it's again, instead of looking at cohort to cohort, uh, just, or at least have more stories about individual growth, individual change, individual, uh, you know. Well, those are hap those are all all across this district, and so I think that's a good idea. I could say student, you know, student X started here, and this is what we did, mm -hmm. and now they're here, and maybe that would be helpful for you because I think that you've been looking for that. And, and um, I think those kinds of success stories, I mean, I can think of five students right off the top of my head. I appreciate that a lot more than a statistic because yeah. I repeatedly feel like our sample sizes are so small that statistics yeah, don't mean a heck of a lot to me. Uh -huh. um, so it seems like three of you are, are, you know, are really into that. So I, I think I would love, that would be a great idea to have student profiles. Like this is where they started. 
This is where we intervened. No, I, th you know? I think, that, and, and then, see the corollary to that is, it worked with these students, these students we didn't get to, those are the students we have to double down on mm -hmm. the next year, mm -hmm. or, you know, so that we can say, okay, you know, we've learned how to do the here, and what are the factors? So they, there could be a myriad of factors, mm -hmm. not all of which are under our control. Sure. But at the same time, you know, I think this, this extra funding is designed to, to make us walk that extra mile just to, to, uh, to help. Yeah. I wonder if there's a way that we can build that into the LCAP, what, you, what we're just talking about right here as a measurable goal. I mean, there are, there are a million things that I have to measure anyway in the LCAP, but ab above that, maybe there's a way that we can identify 10, 10 students. Mm -hmm. And I think those kind of stories help not only uh, those of us who are removed get a sense of, of what's happening, but uh -huh. I think they can be inspirational within peer groups too. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. <coughs> Would you like to second my motion? To approve this? Yes. Sure. <laughs> Great. Any further discussion? No? Okay, please call Aaron. Aye. See her on here. Okay. Nine point nine intra inter district transfer report. All right. So this year we had eighteen applications for transfer of some kind, and we approved three, and they were all. Um, well, one was an intra-district, but the other two were siblings of um, students already in the District of Choice program, which Fort Bragg did, did approve. Otherwise, every single transfer from Fort Bragg was, was denied. We didn't have any requests from Anderson Valley. Um, can you go down just a little bit more? So you can see there's a pretty, pretty good spread here. Five intra-district transfers, five inter-district requests, and um, eight District of Choice. So the reason why many of them were were denied this year were um, because of the size of the classes that they were looking for. Our, our current eighth grade class is very large. Going into ninth grade, we did not accept any of the inter-district transfers except one that was a part of the, um, uh, one who had a sibling already in the program. And then uh, the intra-district transfers, many were from uh, Albion or Elk wanting to attend the K-8 school. And, um, they were denied uh, mainly because we still don't know the size of our kindergarten class, and we have informed them that we will be keeping an eye on the enrollment, and they will be accepted if we have enroll uh, if we have room. So, uh, and then I want to talk about staff members, kids transferring into the district, but I'll talk about that at our policy. So. Questions, comments on that? Thank you. 9.10, consideration of leave. Certificate employee. Um, this is Anna, is that correct? Jason? Yeah. Okay. Um, any, any comments on this one? This is an action item. I'll move that we approve the leave request. Second. Thank you. Okay, please call Aaron. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Uh, board calendar update. Looking at some changes. Yeah, there's one update that I'd like the board to consider. Um, given that we are we lost our business manager at a very inop inopportune time, um, I would like to request that we move our budget and LCAP. 
pu uh, public hearing from the first week of June to June 16th. I'm wondering if everyone would be able to make that. It's a Wednesday. Uh, we need to have it, obviously, sometime in that week before. I think it's a, do you know how, many, how long we need to have it before our adoption? Is it a week? Three days? I just think it needs to be before, right? I think it just has to be before, but, okay. you know. That's okay with me. Mark, Jim? Yeah, 16th. June 16th at, at 5 o'clock. 15th or 16th? 16th. 16th. Uh, Wednesday? Right. Yeah. So that would give Meg uh, and I a chance to really work together on, on the LCAP. Jessica, is that okay with you? Are you with us? Yes, it's okay. Okay. Great. And then, yeah. And then a heads up for the board. Uh, our, tw our meeting is scheduled for June 22nd, which is a Tuesday, our next board meeting. So I think there were some conflicts with some of your schedules. So just remember, it's a Tuesday. What day is it? Uh, June 22nd is our regular June board meeting. Okay, uh, that's an action item, so I will move to approve the uh, change to the calendar. Second. Thank you. Please call the vote, Aaron. Aye. Yes. Yes. I just uh, want to, I, I wasn't quick enough to say this before we started voting, but our current calendar doesn't have our meeting next Monday on it, so shouldn't we put that on? I mean, on next Tuesday, or the 26th, whatever day it is. Wednesday, the May 26th isn't on here. It's not. It doesn't have to be on the calendar? Got yeah. It. Yes, then. Yes. Aye. 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 You're scaring me, Michael, when you say meeting on Monday and then Tuesday. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we, we've thrown out regularity here. <laughs> Uh, 9.12. Res that uh, this was one one of our audit findings, and that we we've never we've never adopted a resolution to um, f to de to um, to communicate how many district of choice spots we have open in the program, and so I asked the auditors for a an example of the resolution, and it's is it, it is odd that it says we're establishing as a district of choice program because we've been a district of choice program for years and years, but I think this is an annual, this is just how it's done annually, so this will satisfy the audit finding, uh, I, I hope. Did they give you the example? Yeah, they, yeah. they gave it to me, so I hope it, <laughs> hope it works. Okay. Um, you know, I, ideally they want us to identify very early in the school year how many spots we have open for the following year, and we, we just can't do it. Um, because we have such a, a you know, our, our enrollment change, uh, changes so much over the summer. Um, so this is, this is good if we do this now. I, they've asked me for it, and I will send it to them tomorrow. I'll move to approve uh, resolution 2021-04. Second. Thank you. Please call Aaron. Aye. Yes. 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 Aye. Aye. 9.13, resolution 2021-05. Step of the maintenance assessment district process. Um, next month we will have a public hearing and then a, uh, adopt the final resolution. It's annual. Resolution 2021-05. All second. Any further discussion? Okay, thank you. Aye. Yes. Yes. Uh, 9.14 policies. So this this policy is residency based on 
Party and Employment. And uh, this one, I, um, I moved up to uh, I moved up this this up to a, as a first reading because I think it ha could have imp implications for next year, and hopefully we can adopt it in June. So what I, the idea here is that we would um, use residency, or uh, I'm sorry, employment, to determine residency for our staff members. Um, we have we have a few staff members who who live outside of the district, who have children who uh, would they would like them obviously to attend MUSD schools, and they are being denied in the district of choice transfer process because of the MOU that we have with Fort Bragg, and. Um, it, it could have really damaging effects on you, ha, our, our staff members being able to come to school and work. So I asked our legal counsel um, if we needed to put anything in this agenda or anything in this policy. Um, all I said was I would like to put in a line that says MUSD staff members' children will be allowed to attend MUSD schools as long as their enrollment does not a push does not push a class size over the class size limits as adopted annually by the board. So, you know, it wouldn't feel good to allow a staff member's, you know, student or child to come in and then we have to hire another teacher or pushes us over the class size limit. So I think it's important that we keep that in there. Now she came back to me and said that the policy is clear enough that we don't have to add that because the, the words may. If you look at the policy, it does say may on there that they may accept, we may accept a student based on resident or um, employment. Um, but she says we can add that if we want. So, um, and I clarified with her, I just said, I just want to be sure that we can allow a staff member's kid to attend under this policy, but deny everyone else. And I said, if we can do that without writing it in, then maybe we'll just go with that. And she said, that is correct. As long as the decision is is not made on a prohibited discriminatory basis, then the board can choose who to admit and who not to admit under this policy. I guess I'm unclear as to which precedes the other. Do we accept district of choice students before we deal with the employer-based residency issues or vice versa? The way I would see it is we do the employer-based residency first because they would be considered actual residents under the policy. And district of choice transfers are not residents. I guess the difference, one difference would be that the, a district of choice student who's admitted in kindergarten is allowed to stay until uh, they graduate, whereas if you're enrolled under a residency waiver, then as soon as you are no longer employed, you lose the right for enrollment. I would agree with that. Okay. For sure. Yeah. <coughs> then they would, yeah, I, would, I agree. So I guess what I'm saying is, I guess what I'm wondering is, would you like to put that sentence in the policy or just leave it as is, as the legal, as our legal counsel suggests that we don't have to. So I guess if we don't have to, then why write it in? Future clarity if we forget or that's we have, true. you know, different superintendents someday and we're still doing it. Yeah, that's a great point. So I changed my mind. I recommend that we put that in. Policy committee did do this? Oh, they did it. They yeah. talked about it. Do you yeah. have an opinion? I think that, that it's been very clear that, that uh, employer residency has been a uh, viable way to be enrolled in all districts in California uh, for many years. And, and you know, so I, we're just doing what the law is, says, I think. Okay. And at some point, I think I gave a report two years ago that so we had 60 kids or so that were staff members' kids in this district, so quite a few. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it, it's complicated in the sense that, that even though we get uh, paid only meagerly uh, by the state for district of choice students, we get 25% of what their ADA equivalent would be in their home district. Mm -hmm. 
for students who enroll under this policy, we get zero dollars. Which, which as is a basic aid district. Which is frustrating because I, I, I contacted Fort Bragg and just said, you know, hey, we have a staff member's kid who wants to attend here. Would you, would you be open to signing off on this one? And and the response was, no, you can uh, you can uh, approve them through the Allen bill, or, you know, through the residency. And I'm like, you know, you're not. It's not like the money is going out of their pocket. You know, it's a little frustrating. But or the funding would be different if they approved it. We would get at least. 25% of the LCFF uh -huh. value. But we've made an agreement that we would re try to reduce our number of transfers from Fort Bragg down to 50 right. before yeah. they started. And we're, we're in the upper <coughs> 50s, I believe, next year. So we're getting closer. You know, we are, in fact, you know, teaching more and more students from outside the district who we're not getting any money for. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, at some point, you know, uh, we should really examine the values, both pro and con. I mean, you know, yeah. we, we've talked about that, but it, it's always good to have another uh, assessment so that we can reaffirm what we're doing. And we'll see if the program gets extended. Well, that's in terms of, of district of choice, but I mean, I think, you know, in, in, in uh, uh, I mean, I guess, do, do the, Students from uh, Point Arena, are they considered district of choice students even though we don't get any money from them? No, I don't no think we, so. we changed that to um, now we, we consider them interdistrict. So it's and, an interdistrict. And that also, we don't get any money still, but it'll, it allows us to revoke it much easier if uh -huh. they're not attending. Right. Okay, that was just an information correct. Um, no, it's an action. Uh, this is an action because then next month it'll go final. Oh, that's an action. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I'll move to approve. Uh, res, uh, where were we? Uh, no, that was a that was a first reading. It's not it's not stated as action. It is though because it, it goes on the consent calendar if we approve it. So. Okay. Well, we're nine point one four. That's what we we're just discussing, correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right. It doesn't say action. Okay. Is that okay? We can I'll vote. I'll second. Okay. Uh, please call, Aaron. Aye. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Berry. Aye. Mr. Jones. Aye. Thank you. Nine point one five. More policies. So yeah, these are information only. Um, lactation accommodation is for staff members, and this will be the the final step. Winspear and Michael, right? You both received an email from an organization that keeps track of uh, the accommodations and policies that we're making for um, preg preg five things they were looking five, for. Yeah. and uh, this was the only one we were lacking. Right. I mean, we had a we have a, a lactation policy for students. But yeah. We don't have one for staff. Right. So, so this will be the final step. So we're step. filling so the, the gap here. That's exciting. And then the complaints concerning district employees. Uh, there is a, a new line in there that says um, I don't have it in front of me, but it says that. Uh, actually, do you have it? Just so, so we can see it, see it. I'm sorry. It says, I can maybe paraphrase, it says that all, all complaints, if more than one person is listed on the complaint, then they all need to sign the complaint. Okay, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, as, as a complaint. Oh, here it is, it's right here. It says, if a complaint, if a complaint is, is involving more than one person, uh, individuals must be named and sign the complaint. So it avoids complaints that say many or a few. Any comments on those? No, we talked about it. It was the, you know, uh, following in line with the discussions we've been having. Okay. Okay. Uh, future agenda items. Um, 
And so we're adding a K A or excuse me, high school. Um, yeah, I think it's a little beyond photovoltaic, though. I, I don't want to call it um, oh, this renewables. Photovo ZNE, photovoltaics, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll call it. Uh, citizens, it. citizens Oversight Committee as well. Yep. Um, and then uh, looking at, at how we're going to deal with uh, the first analyzing how many parents oh. are uncomfortable coming yeah. back in the fall and, and how we're planning to accommodate them. But hopefully the, as good numbers as we can, which I guess involves contacting those families and as well as the ones who disappeared off the radar, the, the 50 or 40, 40 kids who did that. Yeah. Anything else? Uh. Okay. Thank you all. We're adjourned. All right.